Good morning. My name is David Weiner. I'm the chairman of the commission. Before we get started, Mr. Costin is going to lead us in prayer and Mr. Horsley in the pledge. Please stand. Hmm. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, Lord, you are God. God, we come today to thank you for the many benefits and blessings, God, that you have bestowed upon us. Now, God, as we come to deliberate, deliberate issues that concern this great city, God, we ask that you would grant us of your wisdom and your understanding and your knowledge, O oh God, that we may consider all the facts and come to the right conclusions. And God, we ask that you would bless all of these who have assembled in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Would you please join me in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the, the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you, gentlemen. Next, ask Mr. Redmond to introduce the members, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, welcome, everyone. So I'm going to start on that side, on which, if you're sitting out there, would be on the left side of the dais. That is Ms. Victoria Eisenberg. She's an assistant city attorney. She is filling in for, um, for Kay Wilson, who is absent today, and I'm sure she'll do a great job, always does. Um, city attorney, of course, helps us follow the rules and keeps us out of trouble and otherwise just helps us in any way they can. Mr. John Costin. Um, is a retired fire captain who serves at large. Robin Klein is a social worker, um, and she too serves at large. No? God, I can't remember these things. Centerville. Centerville, Centerville District. All right, thank you. Um, so that empty seat is George Alcaraz. He represents the Beach uh, District. He's a contractor, has a number of different business interests. He's not able to be with us today. Um, uh, moving around the corner, D. Oliver. Um, she serves at large. She is a former chairman, a former vice chairman, um, and also has a number of business interests in publishing and restaurants and the funeral industry. Quite the trio. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so she's obviously multi-talented. Um, but that's Dee Oliver. Sitting next to her is, uh, is Don Horsley. Um, he is a farmer, um, a very accomplished farmer, and a hokey. Um, and he is the longest serving member of this body. So. You can imagine we listen to him quite a bit. Um, in the center there of the dais is Mr. David Weiner. David is our chairman, um, and he represents the Kempsville district. Um, he is a contractor in the uh, in the building industry. Contractor is probably not the right term, but eh. um, <clears throat> he works in the building industry. Um, next to uh, David is Mr. Jack Wall. Jack is our vice chairman. He is an engineer by trade, and he represents the Rose Hall district. Um, this gentleman to my right is Michael Inman. He is an attorney. Um, he too serves at large. Um, he's also a guy we listen to a lot. Um, I'm Dave Redmond. I'm a commercial real estate broker. Um, I represent the Bayside District. This gentleman is Whitney Graham. Yeah, I'm using the term gentleman a lot <clears throat> loosely, but I'm using it a lot. Whitney Graham is a um, is a uh, developer and property manager, and he has a number of business interests, and he represents the Linhaven District. <coughs> David Bradley is our newest member. Um, he, uh, well, you're gonna have to tell people more about yourself a little bit later on. He's worked for the city for a number of years. He represents the Princess Anne District. This is his very first day on the job, so let's go easy on David. <laughs> um, but he's very capable, I'm sure he can handle it. Uh, anyway, next to David is Bobby Tahan. Bobby is our planning director. Um, and uh, he, uh, as always, will introduce a few key members of his staff who are in attendance today and always do a great job helping us. As always, thank you all for lunch and, and for all you do for helping us. Bobby. Thank you, Mr. Redmond. Uh, clerking today, we have Nicole Garrido and uh, Pam Sandloop. And starting with our planning administration team, we have Carolyn Smith, Waddell, and Marshall Coleman. We also have with us on our zoning team, uh, Ashby Moss, Hank Morrison, and... I thought I saw Brandon Hackney, our newest planner. Uh, we also have Antoinette folks with our uh, development liaison group, and Carrie Bookholt, 
uh, with our, devel our Development Services Center Administrator, and I believe also Rick Lohman, the city's traffic engineer, is here as well. Thank you, Mr. Tahan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> next, next, we're going to go to the explanation of the rules and how the, uh, it's going to work today. And Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. The Virginia Beach Planning Commission takes pride in being fair and courteous to all parties in attendance. It is important that all involved understand how the commission normally conducts its meetings. It's equally important that everyone treat each other and the members of the commission with respect and civility. We request that if you have a cell phone to either silence it or turn it off. Following is an abbreviated explanation of the rules. The complete set of rules is located in the front of the Planning Commission agenda. The order of business for this public hearing. Withdrawals and deferrals. The chairman will ask if there are any requests to withdraw or defer an item on the agenda. Consideration of these requests will be made first. Consent agenda. The second order of business is the consideration of the consent agenda, which are those items that the Planning Commission believe are unopposed and which have favorable staff recommendation. <coughs> Regular agenda. The Commission will then proceed with the remaining items on the agenda. Today, we will have both in-person speakers and speakers participating via WebEx. <coughs> when an agenda item has been called, we will recognize the applicant or the representative first. Following the applicant or their representative, in-person speakers will be called next, and then the speakers participating via WebEx. Speakers in support or opposition of an agenda item will have three minutes to speak unless they are solely representing a large group, such as a Civic League or Homeowners Association, in which case they will have 10 minutes. For WebEx speakers, once your name is called, please pause for two to three seconds to begin to ensure the commissioners hear your complete remarks. As only one audio feed can be open at a time, do not ask, can you hear me, as you will not be able to hear a response. If a speaker does not respond or if a technical issue occurs which renders the comments unintelligible, we will move on to the next speaker or the next order of business. Please note that the actions taken by the Commission today are in the form of a recommendation to the Virginia Beach City Council. The final decision to approve or disapprove an application <laughs> will be made by the City Council. The Commission thanks you for your attendance and we hope that your experience here today leaves you feeling that you have been heard and treated fairly. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, next, uh, we're not aware of any, but does anybody have any items to be deferred? No items to be deferred. What about withdrawn? Is there an item to be withdrawn? Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. For the record, Eddie Berdon, Virginia Beach Attorney, Ocean Rental Properties, LLC, items 12, 13, and 14. Uh, they requested that those items be withdrawn. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Um, items 12, 13, and 14 be withdrawn. Can I have a motion, please? <clears throat> uh, Mr. Chair, I make a motion that we um, withdraw agenda items 12, 13, and 14. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Horsley, motion by Mr. Wall. The vote is open. By recorded vote of 10 in favor and zero against, agenda items 12, 13, and 14 have been withdrawn. Thank you. Next, we're going to the consent agenda, and Vice Chair Wall will take over. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have six items on the consent agenda today. Uh, the first item is agenda item number one, uh, City of Virginia Beach, an ordinance to amend section 602 of the city zoning ordinance pertaining to dimensional requirements and apartment districts. <clears throat> um, and we've asked the city to read this into the record. Uh, Mr. Hank Morrison. Well, hello again. Um, actually, uh, state your name for the record, please. My name is Hank Morrison. Mm -hmm. Is there um, any opposition for this item being placed on the consent agenda? No, sir. Good. Hearing none. Uh, Please proceed. All right. So this request is to amend Section 602 of the City Zoning Ordinance pertaining to setbacks for yards adjacent to streets in the A12 through A36 apartment districts. The purpose of the proposed update is to relocate but not change the standard related to the 30-foot minimum setback for structures adjacent to streets in an apartment zoning districts. When it was originally drafted, the requirement for side yards adjacent to a street was placed at the end of the ordinance, stating that it applies to all side yards adjacent to streets. Um, the location of this requirement has often caused it to be overlooked um, 
which has created some confusion for city staff as well as property owners in the development community. Um, so the proposed amendment would remove section 602G and insert that 30-foot setback requirement into each of the dimensional requirements, um, and each dimensional requirement charts in section 602A through 602E. So staff is recommending approval of this ordinance as it's essentially just reformatting the code. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, the next item is agenda item number two, City of Virginia Beach as well. An ordinance to amend section 1306 of the city zoning ordinance to add assembly uses as conditional uses in the historic and cultural districts. Um, and the city, we've asked the city to, uh, to speak on this, this item. Is there any opposition for this item being placed on the consent agenda? No, sir. Um, hearing none, um, Mr. Morrison, can you please read this one? All right, so this request is to amend section 1306 of the zoning ordinance to add assembly uses as conditional uses within historic and cultural zoning districts. Uh, so an assembly use is defined as one that involves the gathering of individuals or groups in one location, such as an arena, assembly hall, auditorium, bingo hall, civic center, area mercenary establishments, private clubs, union halls, and excluding religious uses. So adding these uses would provide property owners uh, with a little bit more flexibility and options of, for utilization of their property. Um, staff is recommending approval of this ordinance as the appropriateness and ultimate approval of any assembly use would be at the discretion of city council uh, through the conditional use permit process. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> the next agenda item is actually two items. Agenda items three and four for Lynn Haven Dive Center for a conditional use permit for a vocational school as well as subdivision variants, um, section 4.4B of the sub of the subdivision regulations. Um, the address is 2204 Poplar Point Road and 1413 North Great Neck Road. <clears throat> is there a representative for this item? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman Ross Fierro with Access Global Enterprises representing Lynn Haven Dive Center. Thank you. Are the uh, conditions acceptable? They are. Okay. Very much looking forward to this project. This is a 40 year okay, project one coming. Second. So. Um, before you <laughs> I have a lot to continue, say. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there any opposition um, for this item to be placed on the consent agenda? Not that I know of. Okay. Um, go, let him go ahead. Oh, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I just wanted to say on behalf of the family that is uh, building this, this is a 40-year-old project. Lamb Dive Center has been serving the community for 40 years. Uh, just recently, uh, Big Mike Hiller uh, passed away fighting an 18-year battle with cancer. And uh, there's a great photo of him and his son, Little Luke at the time, and Mike uh, digging this pool originally out uh, by hand <laughs> uh, back in the early 80s. And uh, they're very excited now to bring a whole new generation of divers and swim uh, leaders uh, in the community. So we're very excited about it. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we've asked um, Mr. Graham to read this into the record. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chairman. And as the applicant's representative said, it's been there a long time. I was actually certified to scuba dive there in 1987. Um, uh, so there's uh, this is a conditional use permit application as well as a subdiv subdivision variance uh, application. and. Uh, the applicant seeks to expand and relocate the existing dive facility to the adjoining parcel. The proposed facility is 9,000 square feet. That's 7,000 square foot new building and 2,000 square foot uh, existing building and offers uh, scuba diving training and certification, uh, which for zoning purposes is classified as a vocational school. A conditional use permit is required for a vocational school greater than 7,500 square feet in the B2 community business district. The applicant, applicant uh, also seeks to consolidate five parcels into a single lot. The new L-shaped configuration will have frontage on North Great Neck Road and Poplar uh, uh, Point Road. A, a minimum lot width of 100 feet is required uh, the proposed lot is 92.5 feet wide on Poplar uh, Point Road. Therefore, subdivision variance is required. The subdivision, I mean, uh, the submitted elevations uh, are uh, similar in uh, design as to what's there today. Um, 
The proposed development on the property includes a reduction of the number of ingress egress points uh, from two to one. Uh, streetscape and foundation plannings are proposed, which don't exist today. Uh, staff recommends approval, and um, and uh, we agree with staff and uh, recommend approval of this item. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next agenda item on the um, or the next application on the agenda is agenda item number five. Um, Yvonne Lucas and Esther Schneider. Um, for rezoning from B1 Business District to R5R Residential Resort District. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, Chairman, members of the Commission. Again, Eddie Berdon, Virginia Beach Attorney, representing the co-executrixes of Ms. Ryan's estate. We appreciate this item being on the consent agenda. I want to thank Paul for his help with this application. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there any opposition for this item to be placed on the consent agenda? Um, hearing none, we've asked Mr. Redmond to read this into the record. Thank you, Mr. Wall. This is an application of, Ilan of Yvonne Lee Hypes Lucas and Esther Diane Schneider, co-executrixes of the estate of Berenia Craig Hypes Ryan. Specifically, this is a rezoning uh, from B1 Business District to R5R Residential District. The purpose of this application, it's a housekeeping application. This is a 4,945 square foot lot um, in the Bayside District. Um, I was platted in the 1930s before we had a zoning ordinance or anything else that made a whole lot of sense. Um, it, um, while it's actually zoned for a neighborhood commercial use, uh, it's a residential property. A house has existed on this for a very long time. And so the applicant would like to have it rezoned to I5, R5R, which is the predominant zoning district in a lot of these neighborhoods um, uh, on Shore Drive and, and actually throughout much of the the water, you know, the, the communities that border the water in Virginia Beach, it's entirely appropriate. Actually, it's much more appropriate than its current zoning. Um, there is no opposition. The staff um, obviously recommends approval and the, um, and the commission concurs, therefore, by consent. Thank you. Mr. Wall. Uh, the next agenda item is number 10, Janita White, uh, conditional use permit for family daycare um, at home. Uh, the address is 1109 Malcolm's Way. Um, is there a representative for this item? Mr. Vice Chair, Janita White is via WebEx. Janita White, please wait two to three seconds and then state your name. Janita White. Thank you. Are the, are the conditions acceptable, Ms. White? Yes, sir. Um, is, is there any opposition for this item to be placed on the consent agenda? Hearing none, uh, we've asked Mr. Costin to read this into the record. The applicant is requesting a conditional use permit for a family daycare home to care for up to 12 children within a single family dwelling. The 2,000 square foot home is zoned R7.5 residential district and is located in the Burnham Woods neighborhood. A family daycare home with four or less children is allowed by right in residential zoning districts. When the number of children cared for it increases to five or more children, excluding the provider's own children and those who reside in the home, both state licensure and conditional use permit are required. According to the applicant, she has 30 years of experience caring for children designated outdoor play area is located in the backyard enclosed by a six foot tall privacy fence. Typical hours of operation are proposed as 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. The staff has recommended approval and the planning commission concurs and have placed this item on the consent agenda. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, that was the last item on the consent agenda. I move for approval of agenda items one, two, three, and four, five, and ten. All right, we have a motion for approval. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion by Mr. Wall, second by Mrs. Oliver. The vote is open. By recorded vote of ten in favor, zero against, agenda items one, two, three, four, five, and ten have been approved by consent. Thank you. Thank you for the couple people that want our consent agenda. 
and um, those items will now be scheduled to go to City Council. Um, before we move on, um, Mr. Redmond would like the floor for a minute, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thought it appropriate um, that we take a minute and um, uh, and say a few words about Councilwoman Reba McLennan, who unfortunately died very recently. Um, she was a member of City Council for a number of a number of years, and there aren't that many people who have been active in city affairs who did not at some point um, run across Ms. McLannan. Um, if you did, you probably had a very positive experience. I know I did. Um, she, uh, I thought, taught a great lesson in leadership simply by example. And by that I mean she had um, a great deal of depth and integrity. She uh, had courage of her convictions. She was not afraid to be uh, the lone vote for or against something, uh, or in the minority for or against something. Um, she, and she stuck to her guns when she felt strongly about things. And she could feel strongly about things, which is something I always admired. Um, beyond that, she was unfailingly nice to me, anyway. Um, and I imagine to just about anybody, every single time I ever saw her, which is typically right around here, we weren't particularly close, but when she served in council, I was in and out of city politics and public policy and poking around here quite a bit and in this conference room behind us. Uh, and every time I ever saw her, she smiled and got, you know, got all bright in her eyes and had that bright smile on her face and said, how are you? And I said, I'm good, how are you doing? She said, it's good to see you. And she, maybe would give me a little, she was just an incredibly nice person um, with a lot of convictions and a lot of courage and a lot of determination. And there aren't that many people uh, in the world who get all that together in one package. And um, so uh, she was a uh, very, very well respected um, and admired person. And we are all that much poorer for her passing. So before we get on about our business, I'd like everybody just to kind of think for a minute about what a good person she was and how much we will miss her um, in our community um, uh, uh, because you know, she, she was, I think, some, someone very rare and special. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Redmond. Appreciate that. Okay, Madam Clerk. Our next item of business is regarding the order of the agenda. Okay. so the. Um, we have item number 11 that I think has no speakers, correct? Has one speaker. One speaker, okay. So we're gonna move item number 11. I'm gonna need a motion to move item number 11 to next in front of six and seven and eight and nine. I'll move. Good, we have a motion by Mr. Horsley in the second? A second. A second by Mr. Wall. Vote is open. Mr. Redmond. By recorded vote of 10 in favor, zero against, agenda item number 11 will be heard before items 6, 7, 8, and 9. Welcome, sir. Thank well, Helen, saying, uh, she's going to need to read it into the record here. <laughs> okay, our next item is agenda item number 11, which is Murphy's of Virginia Beach, an application for alternative compliance on property located at 2914 Pacific Avenue in the Beach District. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the Planning Commission. For the record, Billy Garrington on behalf of the applicant. The applicant in this case is Mr. Tom Mooney, owner of Murphy's Irish Pub, 2914 Pacific Avenue. And Mr. Chairman, I think there are actually two speakers, not just myself. So, Okay. Uh, Mr. Fine is here in the audience, and I know Mr. Fine for a very long time, have the utmost respect for him, and I think he is, has some concerns with one of the neighbors to the west of us. So the request that we are here in front of you today is for the alternative compliance for the recurring outdoor events on this property at 2914 Pacific Avenue. This is the Mooney's restaurant that has had music there for some time uh, since it's been going on, and to the best of my knowledge, I don't think there have been any complaints from any of the surrounding properties. <clears throat> Mr. Mooney reached out to all of the businesses that were right adjacent to this, uh, before we came up to make sure that none of them had any problems with it. I think he has even uh, supplied the city staff with some letters of support uh, from Atlantic Home Pacific and some of the other people, but that doesn't mean that we don't have somebody else who's concerned with it and should be because that's people's homes and we want to make sure that we're good neighbors. 
I think the if you look at the staff write up, staff tells you that we have oriented the stage that we are here today to ask for permission for, which is this soundproof walls and the roof that goes over the top of it. We have oriented it toward faces towards the southeast, the residential properties to the west of us that we're trying to protect and make sure that, that we are not a, a, a nuisance to them. And if you also look at the conditions, there are nine conditions in the staff write up. You look at condition number two that says we cannot have any amplified music permitted between the hours of 11 p.m. and 10 a.m. Obviously, we're not going to. But condition number three is really the one that is the catch-all. It says the operation shall not disturb the tranquility of the residential areas or other areas in close proximity or otherwise interfere with the reasonable use and enjoyment of neighboring properties by reason of excessive noise, traffic, lighting, or overflow parking. I think that one condition right there very well sums up that we can't be a nuisance to any of the surrounding properties. And if we do, we risk losing our use permit. So the staff right up to chair in front of you has a total of nine conditions, including those two that I just read to you. We're in total agreement with all those conditions. If you remember, this request was set to be heard last month, and we had to pull it for two reasons. Number one, we had to re remove, relocate the stage because there was a problem with the vision triangle. We had to submit our landscaping plan to the Resort Area Advisory Committee and get their permission. We did both of those. And we also had a seating area around the fire pit that had about six inches of the back of the seat that was encroaching into the city property. That has all been taken care of. And we're back in front of you today to ask for your approval of this request. Last but not least, the gentleman who is in opposition to this or who is concerned lives next door to the West. I will promise you and him that I will set up a meeting before we go to city council with him, myself, and Mr. Mooney, the two of them should meet personally, and he can get Mr. Mooney's personal cell phone number so in case there are any problems at nighttime, he's not calling to the restaurant and just getting somebody that's blowing him off saying, I don't know what you're talking about. You talk directly to the owner if any problems come up, and I will promise each one of you that I will make that, that meeting happen before we get to city council. Any questions? Oh, and I will apologize for the fact that they're already under construction out there. As I have explained to you, that is a really a oversight of your city staff because the city staff said, look, look, the stage that you're wanting to build is not what you're asking for the alternative compliance for. It's the walls and the roof, and they gave him a permit and told him he could go to work. You keep saying, I got a question yeah, got for a question. staff. <laughs> is, we, we were told that there wasn't going to be a roof. On, it shows right on the plans, but it's only yeah, over top does. of the stage. It's not <laughs> over the entire seating area. It's it's. It Wait, calls hold it right hold I'm sorry. <laughs> we had thought you were talking about a roof over the whole outdoor oh, area. Okay. No, okay. It's just over top of the stage. Stage. Okay. Okay. And okay. And the, and the maximum height is eight feet. Gotcha. Thank you okay. very much. All right. Mr. Chair, oh. I'm only aware of one speaker, and um, Cole Morris Fine. <laughs> Welcome, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm Morris Fine. I'm an attorney. I'm also a developer of sorts. Uh, I represent Mr. Lance Golna. Mr. Golna and his family have owned the property to the west for some 35 years, on which Mr. Golna has built 71 apartments in the <laughs> last seven to eight years. He is very concerned about the noise factor that will arise from this special use by Murphy's. It wasn't, this property that he's owned was there at the same time a Chinese restaurant was there and then it turned into Murphy's and Murphy's first was a restaurant, Murphy's, then they expanded to the outdoors and they have outdoor service and that was okay but now we have this potential of of noise from an open uh, stage that's going to be built there and on this stage there's going to be amplifiers there's going to be live music there's going to be movies there are other activities that we don't know about and Mr. Golna is very concerned that his tenants will be affected. Personally, I don't see how they cannot be affected. If somebody wanted to sit on, on their balcony and go to sleep at 8.30 or 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night or have babies, 
uh, it's going to be affected by this noise. The noise doesn't stop at the property line. The noise is not, is still there when you have a setback. The noise is going to be there forever, and that's why there's a requirement that there be a special deviation. It seems to me, maybe I'm talking lawyer talk too, too much, but the burden should be on this special applicant to come before you and say, I will not infringe on your freedom from noise. We haven't heard anything from them to say that the noise won't infringe on my client's uh, tenants. Uh, I must say that my client did not bargain for bands and live Morgan uh, when, he, when he put up his property, and I don't think that the Murphys has shown any reason to get a special exception, and I would ask you to vote this down. Thank you. Sir Holmes, stand by one second. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question. Yes, sir. Has your client received in the past any comments or heard from any comments on anything about loud noises or bands playing? Because, you know, bands have been playing out there, acoustic music, you know, for, for a while now. I can't say because I don't know. He's here. Lance, do you, yes. have you heard any complaints? Yes, I have. Okay. Why don't you have him come up? Sir, won't, sir, won't you come up to the podium, please? <clears throat> I'm Lance Goldman. I'm the property owner of the 71 units. And we have the next day after is when I get the phone calls mm -hmm. from the tenants. So they hear the music up to 11, 12 o'clock at night. And Chicho's last week was playing until 2 o'clock in the morning. So it is an ongoing problem. And it vibrates right through the units, the front units. <clears throat> Jack. Is it, you know, my question, the first thing is, okay, so you mentioned Chicha. Is it Chicho's or is it Murphy's? It's hard to tell. Okay. I've got a question. Go ahead. Where's um, Ashby? Is Ashby here? Ashby? Mm -hmm. <laughs> do, uh, just a quick question on um, Chicho's. Where, do they have, um, and I know you, you might not know this, live music and what if they do, are they permanent for it, and what is the deal with them, with Chicho's? Do you know? They don't have some kind of, they don't have this um, for recurring special events outdoors. Um, but traditionally, restaurants, bars do have uh, live entertainment. And at some point, um, it's enough if it's outdoors to warrant needing this special exception for recurring events. Another reason this one was a little bit different is because the nature of their events proposed is a broader variety than just um, bands performing or music performing. So I don't know the frequency. I don't know if, if zoning has heard complaints or if the police have gotten noise complaints. Uh, they should not be having any outdoor music after 11 p.m. You might be able to. I was there Saturday night at 11.30, and they had a band outside playing. I called the police, and they told me they had to wait for a supervisor, and it would be about 45 minutes for an hour. Step up, step up the page. Oh, so that, and, and, was, and was that Murphy's? No, it was Chicho's. Chicho's. So we might, um, Mr. DeHaan, we might see if we can't maybe delve into that a little bit deeper, see what. <clears throat> Possibly he's going on over there. Mr. Walton. Right. Oh, it's been going on. Yeah. But the problem of policing should not be put on Lance Goldner. And, and the whole issue of, of this noise should have been brought in some fashion before you that they're not going to have any noise. Not just a little bit, but not. I understand. Mr. Wall. Mr. can you... You point out your your properties. There's a, a there's a pointer actually. There's a pointer right here on the on the podium. I have a picture. If you want to. 
I don't know. It's the white one. Is that a channel? There you go, right here. There's two. There's two. That are closer to Chicho's. Well, I'm close to both. Think of both. There and there. And Chicho's is. Okay, got it. Thanks, Ashby. Got it. Any other questions? I do. No, oh, Jack. The um, this is you know not necessarily in the same same um, application, but the Taco Bell. Do you have any problem with the the noise from? No. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Yep. Mr. Garrington. This will not be happening at 2 o'clock in the morning, like they're saying, because of the conditions that you have in the staff write-up. <clears throat> Mr. Fine says that the onus is upon us to tell you that we're not going to do this, and we have told you that because condition number two, that's one of the conditions that we have agreed to. We will not damage or interfere with the tranquility of the surrounding properties with noise, light, traffic, overflow, parking, any of that. That's one of the conditions that the staff has put on us. If we don't agree to that condition, our use permit would be null and void. He would have spent a tremendous amount of money for something that he doesn't even have the ability to use anymore. And last but not least, we have told you, or we haven't told you, but I'm telling you now that this is only going to be 10 to 15 special events a year. This is not going to be something that's going to be going on out there every night of the year. So. He has said that it would be a maximum of 15 events a year, and that's what we're here to ask for your <laughs> so approval for today. If that's the case, Mr. Carrington, then does the number want to be in the conditions of a number of 15? You, that's fine. I have okay. no problem with that. And last but not least, again, regardless of the outcome today, I will have Mr. Goldner and Mr. Um, Mooney and myself meet personally so that he can get his phone number if there are any problems in the future he knows who to call to where he can get to the right person on with one phone call without calling over there and getting someone who just doesn't do anything about it and we apologize for putting you in this position but this is where we have I to got come one more question for yes ma'am um live music mm -hmm. define his his version of live music does that include a drum set i'm sure it probably does it sometimes <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, okay. I'm not a, I'm not a musician, so no, I'm just wrong. Checking. But see how big a band it is. Yeah, but again, the the, the walls are the, are the sound absorbing, and the roof also. And I think that's going to be critical mm -hmm. to this to make sure that it does absorb as much of the of the noise as possible, okay. rather than being outside like it has been for the for the last couple of years that they've been doing it. Okay. For the, for the record, I'm going to point out my concern, which it doesn't. I know it has nothing to do with you. It has a lot to do with what our our city. Of, did with the permitting, but I don't agree with pulling up on site last week and watching half the stage already been built, and that just that set me the wrong way, and I didn't like that, and I, did, I still don't. But um, I understand what happened, so it is what it is. And we have. If to I were in on. your position, I would feel the same way. But again, I just want you to understand that he did what the city told him he could do. Understand? That's where you have to go. Thank yep. you. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. So we're going to add Good. that condition of 15. Yes, ma'am. I'll be more than glad to. Thank you. I have a question for. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Mr. Kerrigan. No, for okay. Fine. You're okay. Thank you, sir. So, if I wanted to have a party at my house, and the noise ordinance is 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., does that mean that as long as the party was done by 11 p.m., my neighbors would not have grounds to complain? It's a bit of a nebulous hole to send me down. To be honest. <laughs> um, the, you will not. You would not technically be viol, able to violate the noise ordinance. I'll say that. How about okay. that? Sorry to give you the the Weasley answer, but no, that's okay. and also depending on the number of people is what also triggers the need for an out, for a special event permit depending sure. on how many people you have at the house. But mm -hmm. in terms of the hmm. the noise violation, as long as the party's over by eleven, I'm in compliance. As long as with you that. don't go over. I'm sorry. I'm going to give you the that's the, okay. the zoning administrator type answer on this one. As long as you don't go over the decibel level as as measured by the ordinance past 11 p.m., then you would not be in violation. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so you're saying there is a decibel uh, requirement that is, for 11? That, that is, it's, Tori, you're more familiar with that code section. I believe it's after 11. Yes, after after 11, there is a decibel level that you cannot go over Okay, that is measured very specifically. <laughs> So then in response to that, that seems to be the biggest issue 
right now based on these complaints. Um, you know, and I certainly would want the city to follow up with, with Chicho's and their, their noise until 2 a.m. Um, based solely on that, um, I would be in support of the, the project. Okay. Mr. Wall. So uh, back to the noise, no, noise ordinance. So it doesn't, it wouldn't apply prior to 11? Is that, is that what I'm? Right, it's also is, enforced by the police department. Um, so that might be why it's throwing um, right. planning staff a little bit of a curveball. So it is it is enforced by the police department. So if there are noise complaints, it should be the police department that's contacted. Okay. I mean, that's it's kind of subjective. It's tough to, because uh, it's, what is it, four feet inside the wall, from four feet from the wall, 75 decibels. Or something. I can't remember what the decibels are. Okay. Right. Anybody else? I have a question Please. about the uh, parking. Uh, arrangement. I'd like to have more, more detail on that. Uh, Mr. Garrington, could you tell us? Where are you go? I'm just not clear on how the parking he arrangement has, is made with the city. He has a off-site parking agreement with this 31st Street parking garage right across the street that he has to keep in keep current for 13 parking spaces in that garage next door okay but they're not are they assigned spaces I'm pretty I'm not sure if they're assigned or not but he has to there is an agreement that he has with that parking garage for 13 parking spaces that there will be available that's for correct that Any other questions? Comments? Motion? Mr. Redmond. Nope. Nope. Mr. Uh, I move uh, approval of the application with the addition of Ms. Oliver's uh, condition limiting the number of events to 15 per year. And I'll second. All right. I have a motion by Mr. Redmond and a second by Mrs. Klein. The vote is open. Mr. Wall, by recorded vote of 10 in favor, zero against, agenda night item number 11 has been recommended for approval with conditions as amended. All right. Mr. Chair, do you want me to read all four of these together? Um, you can, but I want to say a couple words real quick before you get started. Okay. Um, we like doing this, um, <laughs> planning commissioners. And just wanted to take a few seconds to say a couple things. Um, and we as planning commissioners, we actually have a role. And the role of a planning commissioner is look at proper land use, okay? Whether it be stormwater, natural resources, traffic, things like that. Um, and I, I'm looking at people out here and I just wanna point out one thing. Please treat people the way you'd like to be treated, okay? I'm, I've not had any problems with anybody on the phone. I've talked to quite a few people on the phone. I've had quite a few emails from everybody. Let's just treat everybody with respect, okay, and courtesy, and uh, we can, we'll have a lot of fun up here. I um, <clears throat> want to point out a couple things. If you are here to talk as a group uh, or, or talk for a group or a civic league, you'll get 10 minutes, okay? For that one person, everybody else will get three. You'll see a yellow light come on on the podium. When the yellow light comes on, you'll have 30 seconds to finish up your comments. And when the red light comes on, we're going to ask you to stop. We have a lot of speakers, and we want to hear everybody and give everybody the fair amount of time to talk. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Our next orders of business are agenda items 6, 7, 8, and 9. Items 6 and 7 are an application by JTR LLC for street closures on a portion of Ocean Tides Drive, south of Shore Drive, and north of Clipper Bay Drive and a portion of Clipper Bay Drive right of way south of Shore Drive and west of Ocean Tides Drive in the Bayside District. Eight and nine are an application by MP Shore LLC for a conditional change of zoning B2 and PDH1 districts to conditional B4 mixed use district and a conditional use permit multifamily dwellings on property located at 3829 and 3785 Shore Drive, adjacent parcel between Marlin Bay Drive and 3829 Shore Drive in the Bayside District. 
Would the applicant or the applicant's representative please step to the podium? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman, Vice Chairman, members of the Planning Commission, Mr. Tahan and Ms. Eisenberg and uh, planning staff. For the record, my name is Lisa Murphy and I'm a local zoning attorney with an office at 440 Monticello Ave, Suite 2200 in the city of Norfolk. I'm here today on behalf of the applicants, Marlin Bay LLC, JTR, Shore Drive Area Properties, and Bay Liner LLC in connection with agenda items six and seven, which are the street closure applications, and items eight and nine, which are the conditional rezoning and conditional use permit applications. These would allow for the uh, redevelopment of approximately 6.3 acres from B2 and PDH1 to B4 SD overlay in order to construct and operate a 197 unit multifamily apartment building with an exi existing active boat sales facility with space for additional complementary retail uses. By way of background, the owners of the subject properties, the McCleskey and Browning families are long-term landowners who are very active in the community. They carefully selected the Terry Peterson companies as the developer of the properties based on uh, the company's stellar reputation as a local developer with a long track record of high quality projects and a long-term investment philosophy. As you, know, you all know, uh, the Terry Peterson companies will develop a project and they will continue to own it. They won't flip it to a, uh, you know, a, a hedge fund out of Northern Virginia or New York. They will own it, they will maintain it, and they have a very good track record of doing so. The proposed redevelopment project and rezoning reflects years of study, analysis, market research, and outreach, and represents really the highest and best use of this prominent gateway to the city along Shore Drive. Uh, as you know, this is one of the city's primary east-west connectors. The Marlin Bay Mixed Use Project involves, as I mentioned, the redevelopment of approximately 6.3 acres from B2 and PDH1 to B4. Um, and as I said, it allows for the demolition of a boat trailer storage yard and indoor and outdoor boat and RV storage building and then the construction of the new uh, high-end residential apartment community with the existing boat dealership and, and additional space left over. Um, just wanted to touch on a few high points. The applicant, after conducting outreach, as you all know, with various stakeholders, reduced the total unit count of the project from uh, by 30 units from 227 to 197 units. Doing this allowed the applicant to reduce the height of the section of the building, and you all talked about this a little bit at your informal, um, from four stories to three stories. That's that wing that faces the intersection of Shore Drive and Marlin Bay Drive. The section of the wings of the building that will remain four stories conceal the parking structure, which provides full parking for all of the uh, complex. As the staff report indicates, with the combination of uses, they still have one more parking space than they, they're actually required to have. It's important to note, um, you all discussed the fact that this complies with the comprehensive plan, the shore drive guidelines, and the corridor overlay. The applicant in this case, although they could, is not requesting deviations from any of the standard requirements. They meet all of the requirements of the zoning ordinance, uh, including the shore drive overlay. Uh, the apartment community itself will feature high-end amenities, including a re resort-style courtyard pool, multi-story clubhouse and fitness facility, bike storage, kayak, paddleboard, uh, package delivery, and a conference facility. It's also going to have a uh, two-story clubhouse and fitness facility. So this will be consistent with other very high-end apartment communities in the city. The architecture of the building is designed to blend with the Bayfront community and to create a bold statement to define this strategic focus area. Uh, the applicants have proffered the installation of a 10-foot multi-use trail along the entirety of the frontage on Shore Drive, together with providing pedestrian pathways throughout the development and a striped crosswalk to access the Pleasure House Point um, area. Wanted to just touch briefly on the street closure. It's the section of... Um, Pointer. There we go. Let's go back. It's the section of um, Clipper Bay from Shore Drive. There we go. Yep. <laughs> it exists here right now. Uh, that's Clipper Bay from Shore Drive to Ocean Tides, and then Ocean Tides will remain 
as, as part of this uh, street closure requirement, the reviewers went out and evaluated uh, that area and determined that there would not be an inconvenience to the public to go ahead and close that and include it in the overall uh, redevelopment of these five parcels. Let's take a look at your staff analysis. As a result of the carefully planned placement and design of the proposed improvements, the mixed-use redevelopment project complies, as staff indicates, with the comprehensive plan, the shore drive corridor, overlay district requirements, and the design guidelines. It's located within a mixed-use zone of the shore drive corridor, where the comprehensive plan and the design guidelines encourage revitalization and reuse of existing commercial properties. In fact, it stresses that uses should avoid the over-commercialization uh, and be mindful of land use compatibility. So we've got 3.2 acres that's currently in B2 that's actually um, uh, going to be reduced to just over an acre that'll be in that commercial component. As the staff report indicates, because the subject property is within the mixed zone of the shore drive and front shore drive, a higher density development is more appropriate. Less than a half mile from the site, there are apartment buildings within the mixed zone uh, that are over 15 stories tall. Most of the buildings nearby are three stories or taller. And in fact, on the 3.2 acre portion of the property currently, which is zone B2, the owners could build a 200 foot building by right. And this is indicated in your staff report. The redevelopment of the unsightly boat trailer storage yard with a high-end apartment community with an active boat dealership provides a much more desirable and more compatible transition of uses from Shore Drive to the residential dwellings within Ocean Park. Likewise, the design and orientation of the building, the setback from the intersection, which I think Mr. Inman had a question about that, um, from the road itself, uh, the, the building is set back 60 to 80 feet, and at that intersection, if you see there, uh, it actually looks like there's, we haven't measured it, it's more than 80 feet. And that was something that the applicant did at the request of the community to sort of pull the, the project away from the intersection. That gives us the ability to do more open space, uh, more passive uses. So it's very, there'll be lush landscaping. You've got the open space. Uh, you'll also have an art design uh, feature, which will be an iconic identification feature. And then, as I indicated, the multi-use trail ensures that the proposed development is complementary to the natural resource and open space of the city's Pleasure House Point Park. The multi-use trail, as, as Mr. Lohman indicated, is something that the city is going to be developing in phase four, the Shore Drive Improvement Project. This is a big section of Shore Drive that the applicant will actually be uh, dedicating and improving so they can continue this very nice resource for the people that live along Shore Drive. Um, most everybody agrees, uh, you know, you look for the things that people agree on, most everybody agrees that the project is very attractive uh, and it will make this a uh, much more appealing and impressive gateway to the city. Um, as I mentioned, the, uh, it will enhance the Shore Drive corridor to reflect the area's unique character, making the corridor functional and attractive scenic gateway and access way to the resort destination. Wanted to touch on a couple more things. Uh, benefits, stormwater impacts. The subject property is currently improved with gravel, paved parking and buildings. It's almost entirely impervious, and it was developed at a time when the city did not have stormwater regulations in place. By redeveloping this property, the applicant is actually reducing the impervious cover by over a half acre, and they're bringing it up to the current uh, high standard regulations. Stormwater management facilities will be underground, and stormwater uh, will be treated at, uh, before it is discharged, both for quantity and quality. As a result, the total area will continue, uh, that will continue to drain into Shore Drive and Marlin Bay and Ocean Tides has actually been reduced both in area and in purpose cover. The new traffic impact analysis, the applicant uh, studied the uh, area, the signal timing, and as the staff report indicates, with changes to the signal timing at the intersection of Shore Drive and Marlin Bay Drive that allows for more green time for Marlin Bay Drive movements, and then the installation of a left turn lane into the property from westbound Shore Drive, all of the intersections will continue to operate at the same level of service. So this is not going to have a negative impact on traffic. Uh, the applicant, and this is something that n <laughs> normally comes up quite a bit, uh, has proffered that it will reduce existing curb cuts uh, through the, the revised 
the new site plan. So instead of having four curb cuts, which you have now along Shore Drive, there'll be one on Shore Drive and then the one at Marlin Bay. Fiscal impact, this is something that normally doesn't get looked at, but um, the city's economist has looked at this even with the reduced number of units, and they're predicting that over the next 20 years, the project uh, will resent, result in nearly four million in net revenue to the city. So it's very rare that you have a residential project or a mixed use project that um, actually contributes net revenue to the city. In conclusion, today you will hear, and no doubt you have heard, a lot of negative speculation and conjecture regarding the impact of the proposed redevelopment project on the community. Despite the applicant's best efforts to get out the facts and to address community concerns through months of outreach and studies, uh, resulting in significant changes to key components of the project, the speculation and conjecture you will hear regarding the impact of the proposed project simply ignores the facts recognized by your professional planning staff and city engineers. This has been studied by the technical folks whose job it is to study this and they are comfortable. Um, the Marlin Bay Mixed Use Redevelopment Project will revitalize and upgrade this critical gateway and access way to the city and is the highest and best use of this valuable corner. Um, as the staff report indicates, and as I've mentioned already, it does comply with the comprehensive plan, the Shore Drive uh, corridor overlay, and the Shore, Door, Shore Drive design guidelines. Um, uh, uh, Commissioner Oliver had a question about the siding. Um, we had, as WA indicated, that was not something that had come up before uh, the Bayfront Area Advisory Commission. When they looked at the building materials, they didn't take issue with any of the building materials. Um, if the, uh, it's our thought after really researching this, that that would be, that vinyl would be an appropriate siding and would actually stand up better and look better over time than the hardy plank type product, um, but if, you know, because the multifamily is a conditional use permit, that's some, something certainly that if commission felt strongly about that we could add a condition to address that. Uh, as I indicated, staff is recommending approval of all four applications. We respectfully request that you also uh, recommend approval, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have, um, and if not, I'll stand by for rebuttal. Great. Any questions? Yes. I'm sure I'll have more questions after we hear uh, the speakers. But I just, just on the siding, um, is it is it a premium quality vinyl siding, or is it? Can you can you can you or the the builder or developer describe the siding? Yeah, um, it is a high quality uh, premium vinyl siding where they've they've actually looked into what's going to stand the test of time. Um, Don, do you want to come up and address the? The siding, because again, until um, very recently, this wasn't a question that had come up about the siding. Welcome, man. John Peterson. I represent MP Shore LLC. Good afternoon. Uh, the siding that we would be proposing is the premium vinyl siding. The um, the way that's typically measured is based on thickness. It's 0.44 inches, um, and it it has several benefits over the um, cementious siding, party plank. Um, everything from uh, color to uh, wear and tear uh, and even some environmental uh, impacts as well. That's why we've chosen to use that material. In, in it's a little bit of a loaded question, I guess, because I, 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 I have hardy plank on my house and um, hardy planks, I love hardy plank, but the problem with it is that it does need to be repainted, recalked, and it does fade. This final siding, um, how does co color, how long does it last before it starts fading? The color should be indefinite. Um, that's the, the, one of the major benefits of it. Um, the, the, I think that uh, to put some co context on this, vinyl siding today is not what vinyl siding was 30 years ago. And it's because of the fact that Hardy Plank and the other bra brands of cementious siding gained popularity. So vinyl manufacturers had to figure out what was deficient about their product and they've improved it tremendously. Color, uh, you know, retaining color is one of the biggest things and you don't have to paint it. And this has the same appearance as, as the hardy plank? It does. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, that's all. I just, I just wanted to kind of cl clarify that. Um, it is, I mean, you know, we'll get more into it later, but I think it's important that whatever goes here lasts. Mr. Evans. I hope this isn't out of turn, but I just wanted to mention in, in kind of 
as a corollary to what you just said. This, for, this question of premium siding first came up that I remember here when we were looking at a, an apartment complex off of Newtown Road called Nexus that the mm -hmm. Boyd Company's built. You're a developer, you're familiar with it, I'm sure. That was the first time I ever heard the term of premium siding, and the same question came up. And in the course of that debate, they'd said, it's thicker, you don't see themes, it seems as much, it doesn't warp, doesn't bend, it doesn't, you know, it's durable, it's much more durable, it doesn't fade anywhere near as well. If you go down that, and that was some years ago, if you go down Newtown Road, that's a pretty good looking project. Um, it's a very attractive project and sticks out like a sore thumb on that part, part of um, Newtown Road by, <laughs> simply by virtue of its, you know, of its, of its, of its fine appearance. So I just wanted to yeah. add that, because I'd forget about it later on. And, uh, that was a long time ago, that was a while ago. No. It was what? That was a while ago. Yeah, that yeah. Project. That project yeah. still does look good. It still does look good. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, gotcha. oh, I have I'll one for there. the attorney. What is the price point for the apartments? Uh, that, John, do you want to? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I have it for John. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you just want to address the price point for the apartments? Um, at this point, it's just projections, but I okay. think that you could look at a one bedroom and it'd be probably starting around 1,400. And how many square feet is that? Um, around 800 square feet. Okay, thank you. And it's, oh, I was gonna say, keeping in line with the, the Pearl Project, which was, I don't know if you were on the at the time that was done at um, Marina Shores. Mm -hmm. While he's on that topic, what's what's the mix of uh, number of bedrooms? Uh, three bedroom, two bedroom, one bedroom? Right now we're projecting, and this could change when we get into actual design, it's a roughly 42, 43% one bedroom, and then about 50, I don't, I can't do the quick math, 50, a little over 50% two bedroom, and there's only a handful of three bedrooms. Mr. Wall, well, good question. Um, can we, can we go to the layout for the, the apartment complex? Can you, there's a couple things to the, yeah, to that one. Um, a couple things. So the question was asked this morning, which ones are the, the three, not the three, but the three story and the, and the four story. I think that was, this section just, right here. Just to set the context. Based on the intersection, right, was the one they were able to reduce to three stories. Okay. And then right here is your parking structure. And then around the parking structure, you've got the four stories that are meant to conceal the parking structure. So you're not seeing parking structure. What about the club? I mean, obviously the, the pool is in the center. Where's where's the clubhouse that you, you said it was a two-story clubhouse? Is that? Yep. You want to go ahead? It's actually just two. and. You know, plan right of the of the pool itself. It's actually built into the building. And so, it's, okay, so it's part of the structure. That's correct. But that's four stories right there. So is it? It's two stories of of the common area, okay. and then there'll be two stories two of apartments that. above okay. that. Okay. All right. And the landscaping. Um, there's the the access drive on the kind of the south side on the bottom that connects to uh, Marlin Bay Drive. What is so there's Landscaping on that side, adjacent to the um, existing properties, right there. What is is that? Maybe I'd ever looked at what is that? Um, what is that plan to be? The requirement from the in this zoning category is a 15 foot, uh, 15 foot uh, landscaping, landscaping buffer. Buffer. Okay. Um, so those would be um, I don't have the exact species, but they'd be very tall, okay. dense trees. Dense trees. But right there, that's four stories. <coughs> So, it, I mean, they have to be pretty tall, too, because they'd be looking, this four stories would be looking down into the existing, onto the existing properties, because those are only generally two stories that are adjacent to there. Yeah. Yes. Okay, Mr. Bradley. I've got a question just about parking in general, and maybe this is kind of a preliminary stage for you, but... I know you meet the minimum zoning, but how are you going to allocate it when you got one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom? My experience when I go to a car apartment complex is there's always very few guest parking spaces available and, and it's hard to access them a lot of times. Well, we, we had not just determined whether we would do assigned parking spaces. Um, that's a kind of a market question. Um, uh, candidly, we think that the parking ratio that's required as a minimum is higher than necessary, and that's not conjecture. That's based on experience of, of the other um, couple thousand apartments that we either are managing or own 
and um, we have parking ratios that are typically lower than the parking ratio that we have here, and we don't have any parking issues there. So that's based, that's how we kind of arrived at parking numbers, but ultimately we had to meet the, uh, the minimum in working with the uh, planning staff. How many parking spaces are there? In I believe it's 390, let's see, 390 spaces, actually 391 spaces, 358 for the multifamily, and then you've got 32 spaces for the commercial building. Um, and how, how many for the residential? Uh, 358 for the multifamily part of it. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions? All right, thank you. Oh, oh, sorry. sorry. So uh, this is kind of a um, just general, kind of general question, but so the reference guidelines um, and reference documents from you know, to the comprehensive plan, yeah, you know, the ULI. I think the ULI study is referenced in uh, the comprehensive plan. It shows the store drive corridor plan, um, which are both you know, fairly dated, uh, you know, early 2000s, even late 1990s. I think is for the ULI, um, but they have uh, you know, they were approved and included, and and they included. Um, even the Pleasure House Point Park as you know, fairly large development. Um, did you all review those? And you know, in terms of you know, when you were you know doing your research, um, you know, it's kind of an open question, but I'm just curious what you know your review because it's you know those are dated. Um, you know, it mentions you know, apartments aren't from you know, the late 1990s. That it even says apartments aren't weren't even viable. They mentioned the Marina Shores is being viable, but um, well, I guess it, the marking conditions have changed to the point that apartments are now. Um, I mean, clearly there are other apartment complexes on Shore Drive, but. Yeah, and I, I, I can tell you just from having represented them, the other project at Marina Shores, the Pearl, they're actually um, getting rents in excess of what they projected in their early pro forma it's because there's so much demand in the corridor. So you've got not only do you have younger people that we're trying to attract as part of our workforce to the city, but you also have older folks who want to stay in the corridor who, you know, sell their home and they, they can stay in an apartment and be around their grandkids and go to the same restaurants that they always go to. So um, in, you know, in the 20, 25 years since the plan was done, you've seen a tremendous increase in the need for multifamily, high quality multifamily. But you've also seen a, a real decrease in the need for retail. If you look up and down that corridor, um, there are empty strip centers. You've got vape shops, um, you know, local breweries here and there. But there's a real struggle now hmm. for retail. And so one of the things that uh, the uh, applicants did was they really studied, OK, what, what's going to be successful here? What can the market support? Uh, and that retail piece of it, no matter how they looked at it, no matter where they looked, uh, there really, there's not a big demand because you don't have, although it seems like a big population, a lot of the area that you're covering is water. So there are fewer people that you would think within a within the uh, projected area. <clears throat> um, are, you, are you done? Mr. Wall, are you done? And oh, I was going to kind of follow up sure. on that if I, if I could. I, I, I drive by this every day and in and, um, and, there's a lot of, I mean, there's two bank buildings, <clears throat> former bank buildings that are vacant. Um, one of them has about three foot high grass out front. Um, <clears throat> there is, let's see, there's a tobacco shop. I think there's maybe two laundromat. or three vape shops. Laundromat. Um, laundromat. I mean, there, this is the Shore Drive area <clears throat> in Great Neck area, and I live in the area. I, I think it's one of the best places to live in Virginia Beach. Um, we have had a revolving door of restaurants and retail, and I would love to see some of the stuff that's along Shore Drive go away. Um, it just, All right, we'll get there. But that's a whole other subject. But anyway. Any other questions? Mm -mm. All right, we will get back to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk. <clears throat> okay. First speaker, is Danny Murphy here? Yeah. Okay, Danny Murphy followed by Cole Trower. Yeah. 
Handouts. Please state your name for the record. Danny Murphy, President of the Ocean Park Civic League. Hey, sir, sir, can you do me a favor? Hand me over here to the clerk and she'll take care of that so you can start speaking. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't realize I was going to be first. Sorry about that. Again, my name is Danny Murphy. I am the um, president of the Ocean Park Civic League. And first of all, I'd like to thank you all. I've been kind of stalking you over the last couple months watching what you do. And I know that you are very considerate and thoughtful. Um, I've spoken to a number of you. I've spoken to a number of the city staff and you're all very professional. I appreciate that. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank the developers and the owners of the property. Um, we need to remain friends after this, no matter what. I know there's a lot of stiff opposition to it, but I really do think that um, this isn't the only thing going on. I'd like to apologize to them also for the um, graffiti that was placed on their banner. Um, we do not condone that, and we should operate in a civil manner. So I hope you will uh, take my sincere apology for that. I don't know who did it, and if I did, I would certainly um, have words with them. Um, sorry, you got kind of got me off because I thought we were doing two different ones here, <laughs> usually the street closure. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to tell you that we do oppose it. Um, we have met with them a number of times, um, twice. Um, you know, we kind of did the little dance of the, the poker game where they came in with 227. They anted the first, you know, 27, broke it down to 197. And since then, there really have not been any negotiations whatsoever. Um, I will say there was some discussions about other properties within the community, um, but there was no serious discussion on the number of units. Our biggest issue is density. Everything is a waterfall from density. All the issues that we have with traffic, with parking, with the environmental impact comes from the density of this, um, this unit that they're, or the project that they're trying to do. Um, I'll start off first telling you a little bit about the density. The plan says that there is 31.77 units on that, that um, lot there. That is because we're um, using the boat sales um, lot to call that a zoning lot. They've taken the, the, um, the street away. They're going to put an alley there so they can get through the mixed you or they can get through the zoning lot with only a 20 uh, foot alleyway in between. They can then use the 6.2 acres as the calculation for the density is effectively over 40 units per acre. Um, and that's significant. Um, the other thing is they're using mixed use being business. Um, we just heard that retail is not being used very often on Shore Drive, that there's not much of a need for that. Yet they're telling us, well, we're going to put this boat sales, we're going to have retail commercial there, but um, we already know it doesn't work. So what's going to happen in five or 10 years? They're going to proffer that they're not going to develop it. We know how proffers work. We've seen it at Marina Shores with the tennis courts there. Come back in a couple years and say, hey, you know, there's, there's a 40 um, per unit uh, building here. Let's put 25 or 30 per unit on this other one. Um, the biggest problem with that is a zoning lot is that it's not true mixed use in terms of what the city had designed. It is strictly, or not strictly, it is supposed to be used for more urban settings, such as town center, strategic growth areas, and not in the um, strategic focus areas of residential. Uh, the biggest issue they have with that right now is that um, if you look at the, um, if you look at the um, definition of mixed use, it says two or more separate uses allowed as a principal or conditional use that are physically and functionally integrated. So we've got an existing boat sales we're going to take and we're going to say, hey, let's lop it all together, call it a zoning lot. It's not integrated. It actually is only using 2,000 square feet for anything other than the boat sales. In Dubuque, they don't have the parking requirements for that. 32 spaces for 12,000 square feet is nowhere near enough. They're fine on the apartment side, but they're not talking about that. And the, 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 um, comprehensive plan puts it out. 
The other problem is that the zoning or mixed use says it must be within the same structure. That is clearly two structures. There's going to be the apartment complex, and then there's going to be the retail. And it straddles that. If you look at the definition, clearly not within that. Um, the other issues that I have with it, um, obviously the guidelines, um, when we talk about that, uh, it does not meet um, the um, intent to develop mixed use as a principal tool for redevelopment as a preferred land use pattern in the strategic growth areas. Shore Drive is not a strategic growth area. Um, and as I mentioned, the proffers, Uh, talk a little bit about density in the packet that I gave out to you there. Um, we know that the comprehensive set plan says that the infill should be compatible with the density and preserving and protecting the character of established neighborhoods and achieving the lowest reasonable density for future residential uses. As you can clearly see, as I said, effectively that's 40 units per acre they're putting there. If you, if you take it and you look at it and say, what are they actually developing? They're not developing the boat sales building. They're only developing the one, uh, the two lots, or actually it's PDH1 and B2 there. Um, you'll notice that I pulled the um, open data set of address points and I plotted those out individually and I also plotted the 197 units that they want to put on that four, and four acres of land. Um, you'll see that there's uh, roughly 1,563 Units in Ocean Park, um, I include areas on the bay, Pelican Dunes with that because the um, primary egress and access is from um, uh, Shady Oaks Drive. Uh, let's see. If you look at the density of those other ones, uh, the closest one is 50 units per acre, and that's at the Chesapeake House. That was built in 1975. That was even before we had a comprehensive plan. If you look directly across the street, there's A18, that was a B2 project that was turned similarly into apartments A18, those are condos. Um, the density is significantly lower on those. It's only 12 per acre. If you look at the other B4 properties within that area, uh, Ocean, uh, the villas at Ocean Park, Vintage Point, townhomes at Roanoke, Pendleton, Harbor um, Condo, Bar Harbor Condos, uh, Bay Vista, they're all below that 31 point. And significantly, as you get closer to Pleasure House Point in the green zone, yes, it is in the mixed use of the Shore Drive area, but it's on the border of the green zone, meaning Marlin Bay is the dividing line. It sits on the very edge right next to the pristine 118 acres of Pleasure House Point. Yes, it's reclaimed natural area, but it gets significant traffic. Um, Ooh. Uh, see. Um, I think the, the biggest concern is what it's going to do for the neighborhood, to be honest with you. Um, I, I look at what they're trying to do. I'm not insensitive to the building costs. I understand putting the garage and the retention vaults and everything costs money. Um, and I know that, you know, currently, we're certainly experiencing a lack of affordable housing. I think we would have to go far stretch that this is, may not be affordable housing. Um, it's called luxury apartments for a reason. Um, not that I'm not gonna say it's not gonna have any impact, but um, I believe the impact to put 200 units on four acres within a historic Bayfront community is certainly gonna have a huge impact. It's gonna have cascading effects. I expect my other colleagues will talk somewhat about that walk you through the individual points. But um, at this point, I'd like to know if, who has the first question. Questions? Yes, Mr. Redman. Uh, first off, I appreciate your call. I'm one of those guys that you had a good conversation with. Yes, sir. Um, and the other thing I want to say is I appreciate your apology. I was appalled, frankly, at the vandalism on this site. Yes. Vandalism has no part, not only in any public policy debate, doesn't have any part in the city at all. You're exactly So right. it's property crime. So, and, uh, and you're the first person who's ever, I've heard express that. Um, so I, I think that Thank was you. important and I appreciate that. You did a good job. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Oh, appreciate it. Oh, Jack. So, here, um, would you be opposed if it, if they would, I mean, I'm not saying, yeah, this is a, anything that we would recommend, but 
on to I mean, call, would you let's be, make a deal. I mean, let's say there are apartments, just any apartments there, would you be opposed oh, to Oh, I'm not opposed to apartments whatsoever. We don't care. I mean, you could put condos there. 200 condos would have the same effect. Um, I, I believe that we do need apartments within the city. It's not the apartments I oppose, or, you know, I think we oppose. Um, we're looking for the, uh, you know, I, I think what they presented is um, the maximum use for that property with 200 units. What I ask and what I think it's incumbent on you is to find the optimal use, and that's to take into the factors of account of what the density is and looking at the neighborhood. So it isn't the apartments we post. So how many, how many people are part of the Civic League? Um, we have about um, 300 members, um, but those contain family members as well, so it's more. And then I represent um, roughly 1,400 of those are in Ocean Park. Um, as I said, Pelican Dunes and areas on the Bay have separate home ownerships, and um, okay. Bay Lake Ponds is separate as well. Okay, so this, um, this map represents Ocean Park. So and Aries and <coughs> Pelican Dunes, um, because they use the Shady Oaks Drive that comes up to the Marlin Bay intersection. Okay. So that's their main point of egress and ingress. Where is um, where's Pel Pelican Dunes? Uh, Which? How's oh, sorry, it's, it's it the, it would be on the top left for you. And is the green ones to the top left that are put up there? Okay, okay. So that the dunes up yeah, there. Yeah, that's right? way too. Um, areas on the Shady Oaks goes there. down, so it'll be at the end of Shady Oaks. Okay. But they use that same entrance where the light is. Okay. Good. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cole Trower, and is Tish Fraser here? Okay. Following Mr. Trower will be Cheryl McCluskey. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. It's a great day to be in the greatest city in Virginia in the entire country, Virginia Beach. My name is Cole Trower. I am a homeowner at the age of 29. I bought my own home on the very street that he said that everybody's going to drive to and go to the beach, 3970 Aries Way. Uh, I have 10 years in the restaurant industry, having experience as a waiter, a bartender, uh, even washing dishes. You know, it's not a glorious job, but you've got a lot of restaurants and folks on Shore Drive that that's how they make their living. And I think a lot of my neighbors here, I might have served them an orange crush or crab dip once or twice. Uh, I also have 10 years of experience working for, the, or not 10 years of experience working for the city of Virginia Beach, one year of experience working for the city of Virginia Beach briefly in economic development. And during my time for economic development, I focused on business retention and acquisition. And uh, the city of Virginia Beach tax dollars, millions of dollars each year go towards business retention and acquisition. That's what makes our city great. We have great businesses and people enjoy working here. One of the pillars of having economic development be being so strong and when you are pitching these companies for the city is we sell them on our quality of life and that we have places for their workers to live. And right now, young people in this city cannot find a place to live. I just got a text five uh, days ago. Hey buddy, how's it going? I just moved back and I'm looking for a place near Chicks on Shore Drive. Do you know anywhere? I don't know anywhere. No one knows anywhere. We have all of these young people that go off to college and then we say, why don't they return? It's because, number one, they don't have a place to live that's affordable, that's safe, and nice. And I live and own a home. My girlfriend owns a home on the same street. And I am a member of the Aries on the Bay Civic League. And I was briefly the parliamentarian of the Ocean Park Civic League for a month or two. Wasn't a great job, trust me. Uh, so I will tell you this. It is not unanimous that, this na that our, my neighbors don't want this development. You know. Uh, I think sometimes we get caught up in details, and details are important, but I think sometimes we need to take a step back and look at the bigger picture here. Our city's growing, and that's a good thing. We have people that want to live here and work here. We must make a plan for those people to thrive in our city because, you know, it is our future, and that's the decisions made here today will impact not only our, re our residents, our businesses, and then also, you know, just everything, how we conduct our daily life. And I would just encourage uh, Commissioner Weiner's uh, comments as I run out of time. Uh, I have been slandered, attacked, and just vilified on Facebook and next door by some people sitting behind me that have just trashed anyone 
that would stand up just to say, hey, I think this might be a good idea. And I think if that wouldn't have happened, some of my neighbors might be here today saying the same thing. I appreciate your time, your public service, and I hope that we have a good lengthy debate today on the issues and stay away from vitriolic attacks like we've seen on Facebook. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Cheryl McCluskey followed by John Farr. Welcome. Hello. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman, and members of the Planning Commission. For the record, my name is Cheryl McCluskey. Thank you for your service to the community and helping make Virginia Beach a well-planned community. The McCluskey and the Browning families have owned property in Ocean Park neighborhood for over 50 years. The McCluskey family has allowed the public to benefit from the vacant open space during our ownership, including the land that is now Pleasure House Point. My dream has been to fulfill my late husband's vision by developing quality, reasonably priced, multifamily residential units that will allow new families to become part of this beautiful Bayfront neighborhood. We have teamed up with the Terry Peterson Residential, a family company with a stellar reputation and long-term commitment to the community. John Peterson and Tuck Bowie are known for building high-quality, multifamily rental housing. We have also selected the well-respected Timmons Group to provide excellent project engineering and Cox Cleaver to provide design quality. Together, we will create an engaging community of coastal living along Shore Drive. During this planning phase of the project, we have listened to the concerns of the neighbors and government officials. And that is why we reduced the density from 227 to 197. The current zoning allows us to develop a full-scale commercial and retail business without any further permission from the city government. However, we think the highest and best use of our land, our company, and our community is to build multi-family housing. As you know, the housing stock in Virginia Beach is down significantly from last year for both single and multi-family housing. This development will provide reasonably priced apartment rental properties that are needed for the citizens. The city's economic impact report shows that this rezoning will have a $3.78 million net positive impact over 20 years for the city. Very rare for this kind of development project. The traffic impact study demonstrates that there is a reduction in traffic from uses allowed under the current zoning. The combined average daily trips for our current business zoning is estimated to be 2,074. However, if we build 197 multifamily units, the number of average daily trips will be an estimated 1,448, which is 30% less than the uses allowed under the current zoning. We have also exceeded the requirements for the number of parking spaces for residents to prevent parking on neighborhood streets. Parking will be shielded from the street. The, cool, the school's impact study shows our project will have minimal amount on schools. Any questions for Mr. McCluskey? I just want to say, based on all these comments, along with um, planning staff recommendations for approval, and, and behalf of my company and our trustworthy building partners, we ask you to approve our application. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Any questions? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. John Farr, followed by Andrina Fisher. <coughs> Welcome, sir. Good afternoon. All right. Thank you for giving me a couple minutes to speak today. My name is John Farr, and my family lives at 2105 Woodlawn Avenue. We've been there 11 years and can't imagine being anywhere else. Uh, the appearance, character, and longtime residents are some of the many reasons why we love Ocean Park. We value our privacy, but welcome many to our Bayfront community. It's an excellent flow that is currently manageable. manageable. Uh, change is inevitable in life. Many of us are asking for change that is reasonable and considerate of our beloved Ocean Park. 
The current Marlin Bay proposal is too aggressive and too dense for many residents. Multi-story housing complex is the exact opposite of our single family homes. I believe many of us are asking to be heard and frankly just want to find somewhere to meet in the middle. Thanks for your time. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Thank you. Andrina Fisher followed by Mike Wills. <clears throat> My name is Andrina Fisher. Um, my husband and I own the townhouse at 3836 Ocean Tides Drive. When we purchased the townhouse a little over three years ago, we thought that the lot behind our home would, would not remain empty forever. Um, we thought eventually the boat dealership would expand or perhaps some additional townhouses or duplexes would be built. Never could we have imagined that someone would have the idea to build a four-story, nearly 200-unit apartment complex right in our backyard. If you look at the plat map, our townhouse is the last end unit on the left side of Ocean Tides Drive. I've stated in my previous letters to all of you that our home would arguably be one of the most negatively impacted should this project be allowed to move forward. The apartment complex could potentially reach heights of 50 feet or more. The developer plans to build a street directly behind our fence where no street currently exists, and trash facilities would be built close by. They also plan to close the crossover to Ocean Tides Drive. What does all of this mean for us and our neighbors? It means that we would no longer enjoy any privacy in our backyard. It means the apartment building, due to its towering height, will likely block most of the early to late afternoon sunlight that we currently enjoy. It means constant traffic noise from apartment residents, visitors, and service vehicles entering and exiting the complex. It means light pollution at night and noise pollution at all hours of day and night. We can currently access our street by turning left off of Marlin Bay Drive, but once the project is complete, we'll have to drive up the road and make a U-turn to get to our house. I don't consider that a small inconvenience. I also fear the value of our home will be negatively impacted if this development is approved. We don't want to sell. We love the charm and character of the neighborhood, but the apartment complex would destroy the character of Ocean Park. I assume that many of you live in single family homes and I'd ask each of you to imagine how you would appreciate a project of this size being built right behind your backyard. I've noticed that those speaking in favor of it don't live <laughs> directly next to it like our home is. Um, can you honestly say that this wouldn't negatively impact your quality of life or the value of your home? I'd ask you if your role in the Planning Commission is primarily to further the interests of developers or are you also here to protect the interests of the residents that would be negatively impacted by a development of this size? I hope the latter is also true. We aren't against appropriate development, but the proposed Marlin Bay apartment complex does not fit in the existing footprint. Hundreds of residents have reached out to you and asked you not to approve this project. Please listen to them and to us and vote no. Thank you. Thank you questions? Any questions? Um, do you mind using the pointer and pointing right where your house is, please? Okay, I haven't used one of these before. Yeah. It doesn't <laughs> work very well, I don't think. Which button? Oh, I got it backwards. Oops. I must have forwarded, sorry. I do see a red button. But Set up. It's gone. Yeah. Hang on. Okay, get the slide back, and I found the red button. We are right here. Okay. And so the shadow from the 15-foot tree line that they spoke about is ironically longer than the shadow from the building, which could be 50 feet. So you can imagine that the shadow actually that would be cast by this building on our property is going to take all the sunlight. So explain to me. I just because I'm. I don't I don't why you have to make a u-turn because currently when you come from Marlin Bay along here you can turn left into Ocean Tides Drive there's a little median strip median strip mm -hmm. but the plan is to close off this median strip to create an access into the street that goes to the apartment complex at least it was at the first plan that I saw okay so right now it's an empty lot and I understand that you know an empty lot won't remain empty forever but you see, they're building, tr they're planting trees directly on our fence line, um, where currently there aren't any trees, and they'll be 15 feet high. Um, that's closing us in, in my opinion. And then you have the residents here in the four stories, which I imagine they're going to have to build up, you know, um, about seven to eight feet above the el current elevation, and then build on top of that the four stories. So we'll have people that live here and here, looking directly into our backyards and into our windows. Well, I'm um, I would imagine that's why the trees are there. 
tree's only 15 feet high, the building could be close to 50, 55 feet high. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Mike Wills, followed by Carly Swift. Good afternoon, Commissioner, Planning Commission members. My name is Mike Wills, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today about this application. I moved into Ocean Park back in 2000 into a duplex condo, uh, so I've been in there over 20 years. Love the neighborhood, but uh, you know, I've seen a lot of changes, and it's getting more and more dense. And, and, and nowadays, it's uh, summer weekend; you can barely drive you know a car down down the roads, you know, with cars parked on both sides of it. So it's, it's changed a lot and, um, you know, and there's many reasons uh, why, you know, we're opposed to this. I'm personally opposed to it. You know, number one you've heard is the density. I just don't feel that's compatible with the existing neighborhood and not in compliance with the comprehensive plan and the shore drive corridor project. And by all means, I'm not against growth and redevelopment. I really feel like this property is prime for redevelopment, but it needs to be done within the existing zoning rules of the property and does not warrant a change. Uh, I'm a, I own a heating, air conditioning, and electrical contracting business, does a lot of new construction. So like I said, I'm all for growth and smart development, but it needs to be at the right, right place and not at the detriment of the existing property owners that have lived there for a long time and made Ocean Park their home under the current zoning regulations of this property as well as their own. So it needs to be developed within uh, the existing densities of the surrounding community. Um, and just to give you a couple examples, you know, talk, talk is cheap, and I wanted to give you a couple examples of where I personally and as well as the community put our money where our mouth is. Back in 2004, I was lucky enough to uh, find another property in Ocean Park, a uh, duplex, uh, basically um, a uh, duplex rental property that you know, built in the 50s. And um, I decided to tear it down and build a single family home, and that's where I reside today. You know, of course, I could have you know, put another duplex on it and made quite a bit of money, but I didn't think that was the, the right thing to do. We didn't need more density in Ocean Park. Then as an executive member of the Ocean Park Civic League, which I served on for, for many, many years, back in 2006, 2007, we sold the old fire and rescue building property that we owned in Ocean Park. And again, zone R5R, we could have sold it you know, to a developer, let them put in a duplex on it, but we decided to put a deed restriction on it that it could only be sold, it could only be redeveloped as a single family residence. And so, and thus we took a much lower value for the property than we could have otherwise received. So, so I ask you to um, please don't condone the smoke and mirrors you know, scheme to include property in this whole proposal. It isn't even part of the redevelopment and do not approve this application as proposed. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Yep. Uh, can you tell me, uh, you, didn't you mention that there are a lot of cars parking along Marlin Bay Drive? No, not necessarily Marlin Bay. I live on the other side of Shore Drive, but like along Powhatan, where I come in and out of my section of the neighborhood, there's cars every weekend parked on both sides. You can barely get you know, one car down the middle of the street. It's, it's gotten Does really bad. Relate to this development. Well, I just think, you know, with all these, you know, con all these apartments, you're going to have lots more visitors to the area. Obviously, you know, the people that live there are going to have visitors, and there's gonna, they're going to be inviting people to come to the beach, obviously, and just, you know, put a continuous strain on the parking that's available in Ocean Park. And in what ways does the design or the proposal for this project not comply with the Shore Drive? development guidelines. Well, it says it should be within the existing character of the exi surrounding neighborhood, essentially, and it, it, existing density, which is far exceeds the existing density, and it's not in character with the rest of the neighborhood. There's no other apartment buildings in Ocean Park. It's all townhouses, duplex, you know, things of that nature, mm -hmm. single-family homes. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Please. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Carly Swift, followed by Andrea Lindemann. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you for your time. Thank you for hearing our comments. Um, I would like to highlight a few Can you points. State your name. For the oh, I'm sorry. I'm Carly Swift. I'm an Ocean Park resident and business owner for 31 years, and oppose this project in its current. Um, plan. So I'd like to reiterate and highlight a few points from Faith Christie's letter that you may have received on September 1st, who, 
as you probably know, have been a um, previous worker for the city planning and also helped with the short drive corridor plan and participated in the BAC. Um, we are not opposed to development for these properties. Um, we would like to see these properties developed with a project that complements the surrounding residential areas. And as you have indicated in your previous report, this area is identified as a suburban focus area in the comprehensive plan. A plan that recommends low, dense, low to medium residential density and development of structures that are complementary to surrounding uses. A proposed development of a four and a half story building with 197 units contained within it is not low to medium density. Low to medium density is 12 to 18 units to the acre, which is keeping of the existing densities in the area. The proposed height and bulk of the building is not complementary or in keeping with the existing residential or commercial uses in the area, and the height and size of the building will overwhelm the existing residential uses. The proposed reduction of impervious areas indicated in the report looks good on paper, but until the proposed improvements, including stormwater management, are made to this section of Shore Drive, there will be increased problems with drainage and flooding. This section of Shore Drive, as I'm sure you currently know, is currently under design review and the pro project is expected to begin possibly in 2024, maybe 26 or 27. The Shore Drive Corridor Improvements Phase 3 were scheduled in 2019 and have not begun. So filling a site to accomplish a seven foot elevation will cause adjacent properties to flood. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. You. Any and questions? Thank you. Thank you. Andrea Lindemann, followed by Mark Faust. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Andrea Lindemann, and I live in Ocean Park. Um, and I want to be brief. I just want to make two points, because you'll hear this, the very same points, probably. Um, it strikes me every time that I uh, drive home down Shore Drive. I drive by Marlin Bay Drive, where Pleasure House Point comes all the way to Shore Drive, and it strikes me the sheer length and mass of this proposed building. And then I learned something from Mr. Dow's report. It gets worse. The buildings will, in fact, be taller than four and four and a half stories. In order to construct the stormwater uh, detention system, the site will need to be filled in mm -hmm. to an elevation of seven or eight feet above sea level. And so the measuring of four, and a four, four or four and a half stories will start from that elevated level. This is, again, just a demonstration of the massing uh, of the building, um, which goes against the uh, shore drive design guidelines. Um, the other thing I would like to say, so this building will dwarf its surroundings. And so what, is, what are these surroundings? This location is not a blank state slate. It's in the middle of Ocean Park. And I feel like the, the staff report that we read kind of glosses over um, giving this figure of 31.77 density. This is a huge increase over other recent projects. And so I went back and I looked at some of the staff reports for two recent projects that were okayed for Shore Drive. And they use uh, the language of the comprehensive plan talking about infill development. That infill development should be at a density that's compatible with the surrounding area. So at um, 3746, 3744 Shore Drive, came in at 14 units per acre. 3739 Shore Drive came in at 17.4 per acre. And the staff reports used the language in the, the comprehensive plan about in, to justify the approval, um, saying that this was, had to be compatible with the surrounding area. 
So I just want to say that we chose Ocean Park because it had atmosphere, history, and personality. And I think that this has value not only to the neighborhood, but it has value to Virginia Beach City to preserve this kind of neighborhood. It's blinking at me. <laughs> yeah, so I hope you will listen to the language of the comprehensive yeah, plan. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you for your comments. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Mark Faust, followed by Debbie Cohen. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen of the Planning Commission. Uh, I'm Mark Faust. Uh, I've been a resident of Ocean Park for over 30 years. During this time, has grown as a vibrant neighborhood with wonderful blend of families and individuals. Its proximity to the natural area, the beach, local businesses, as well as being in a great school district make it a very desirable place to live. I'm strongly opposed to the proposed I'm strongly proposed to the Marlin Bay apartment development. I'm concerned with the sheer volume of people and autos that will impact the neighborhood adversely. The traffic on Shore Drive at the proposed area is already overwhelming, including recent fatalities of drivers and, and pedestrians. Right on the corner of, of Shore Drive and Marlin Bay, uh, a pedestrian was hit not long ago. Uh, as part of the Civic League that assists the adopt a spot that cares for Pleasure House Point, I've seen the impact of the increased use has in this fragile environment. Lots of trash, pet feces, and the disturbance of wildlife. The, uh, along the street there on, short, on Pleasure House Point side, it's only parking till you can't park after dark. So everyone is supposed to, if there's overflow parking, they're not allowed to be there after dark. It's all going to be on this side of the street, maybe. That's another concern. It's a wonderful place to, for people with families just starting out and growing, retirees and pretty much everybody in between. Uh, in my opinion, a high density project with almost 200 uh, rental units will undoubtedly tip the balance of the neighborhood in a negative and permanent way. And I urge you to say no to this project. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Thank you. Debbie Cohen, followed by Todd Goforth. Welcome. My name's Debbie Cohen, and my husband and I live on Pendle Pendleton Avenue near Bar Marlin Bay and Tour Drive. I've never been at a meeting like this, so. A uh, little nervous, but um, I wanted to speak because I'm very concerned about what the um, proposed development will do to my neighborhood. Um, my, my husband and I moved here a few years ago, and we decided we wanted to live off of Shore Drive. We just fell in love with the area. We're really happy living here. We love walking at Pleasure House Point and in our neighborhood and um, going across Shore Drive to go to the bay. It's a like perfect location. But um, uh, main thing, I mean, I, I support what um, the others have said, the Ocean Park um, Civic League and the other speakers have said in opposition to the project. But um, my main concern is, is definitely like there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of units proposed in this apartment um, complex and um, it's a, seems like a very high density compared to what I've seen in the surrounding areas and also um, the recent development I've seen on Pendleton Avenue and in my area has all been three-story townhomes and much, much lower density. I'm very concerned about having so many um, additional units coming into that small property. Um, the, the other thing is um, looking at the Bay Area Advisory Committee, um, which I think understands and supports our, our special shore drive community. Um, they voted in opposition to the project. Um, they indicated that um, there needs to be a reduction in the height considering the two-story townhouses adjacent on Ocean Tides Drive and also saying the project is not congruent with the existing shore drive corridor guidelines and comprehensive plan and therefore they recommended denial of the application 
So, you know, as others have said, I'm not against development of the property. I just hope that whatever development, it will preserve and protect our community, our, our neighborhood community. And I appreciate your, your time and consideration. I know a lot of people are talking and sending emails, letters, and I appreciate that you consider them all. Thank you, ma'am. Any Thank questions? You. Thank you. Thank you. Todd, Todd Goforth, followed by Todd Solomon. Welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Todd Goforth. I live at 3850 Ocean Tides Drive. My wife and I own a uh, townhome there, and this development would back up right to our property line. Therefore, we vehemently oppose the development. I've lived in the neighborhood for over 15 years. And just to flush out what everybody's been saying, there are so many people in our neighborhood that have been there for a decade or longer. We're a very tight-knit community. Most people don't know, we don't have an HOA, a homeowners association. We police ourselves and take care of what we have. And if you look at the field that they're talking about, there's no trash dumps, there's no you know, broken down cars or anything. Our neighborhood does a really good job of taking care of itself and policing itself. Now, I live at the end of Ocean Tides that is by Pleasure House Point. And that takes me back to when Pleasure House Point was under question from another developer, fine man. And Sandler's came to, and made a great presentation. What an elegant speaker, great presentation. But the big elephant in the room has always been density. Density. I don't care how great you're presentation is who you are, how much money you have, it's density is the problem. Now to put a personal thing out, if you live in our neighborhood long enough, you know about the young woman that died across the intersection there at Shore Drive in Marlin Bay. You know about people that have been hurt. Now, as I look at this, the crosswalks, if people are gonna go to the beach, are gonna go straight across. They don't typically go down to the crosswalks. On a Saturday, traffic is tremendous on Shore Drive. People going to the beach and the other thing that Mark Faust brought up, he's my neighbor across the street. If you look at Marlin Bay Drive, Pleasure House Point, what a fantastic thing that the city did, along with other people. But during the day, you can park on Marlin Bay Drive and access Pleasure House Point. At, the sign says after dark, you have to move your vehicles. There's not supposed to be anybody in Pleasure House Point after dark. Therefore, it's an excellent opportunity if you live in those apartments you come home, you can't find a parking spot. Where are you going to go? You know the cars are leaving after dark, especially in the winter. There will be cars lined up and down there. I see it on the weekends. There's cars lined up and down there already on the weekends, doing what we hope they would do, accessing Pleasure House Point. And the last thing I want to say, the beach. We all live around here. We love the beach. The density at the beach has got tremendous because we have no sand replenishment. What's that have to do with? Well, you have so many people where we can't watch kids anymore. It used to be there was just one person, you had an open view. Now that you're so crowded, you can't see the little kids anymore. And I would hate for that to be the, 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 the straw that breaks the camel's back when some kid, we can't find them or they get injured because there's so many people on that beach. And who knows when we're going to get sand replenishment with COVID going on. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, sir. Any comments, questions, questions? Yes, sir. Um, and, and I just want to ask a question because you're the second gentleman to mention the parking along Marlin Bay Drive in the dark and stuff. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what that has to do with the actual apartment complex because they have their own parking garage. So these people that live in the apartment building are obviously going to utilize the garage. So I'm just trying to I'm trying to figure out. And you, you are correct. In a perfect world, they have planned to the hilt, and anybody that comes to visit or lives there has a parking spot in the garage. Or, the, But I'm just saying, typically, weekends, everybody that you know when you move to the beach wants to come visit you. Okay. Holidays wants to come visit you. All of a sudden, you got friends that you never knew you had. And, <laughs> <laughs> and if, if you don't have a place to park and you see all this open spot, you know, you're naturally going to park there. Okay. So that's that's my comment. And, and it, it already happens now where people that come into our neighborhood can't find a spot park on there at, at after dark. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. 
Todd Solomon followed by Wendy Crutchfield. Welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Todd. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to keep my mask on. I was with 68,000 crazy Hokie fans this past weekend. So for your benefit, right, I don't, I don't want to get you if, if I have Thank an you. So I'm not going to pass that. Anyways, my name is Todd Solomon. I, I live off of Shore Drive. I'm representing the Shore Drive Community Coalition. I'm here to ask for your opposition of this project. At our May 24th meeting, the Shore Drive Community Coalition voted to oppose this development as it stands. Again, not opposed to development per se, but the density of this development. I've been up here many, many a times talking about density on Shore Drive. So this isn't something new that you're going to be hearing about. However, some of the items are specific of the reasons behind the decision points of this one that are different than others. Uh, you did hear Ocean Park Civic League did vote to oppose this. Uh, the Bayfront Advisory Commission also voted to oppose this development. In the ULI study, which was a 1997 study that kicked off all the shore drive quarter plans, which you all know about, it does state specifically in there that the communities of Ocean Park and Chicks Beach, where zoning allows a transition from single family to duplex or higher density units, attention should be paid to the results of this intensification. The density of new developments in this area should not overwhelm these two communities, which have made fine homes and neighborhoods for their residents. Again, density, overwhelming, these questions, these words are used throughout. Uh, staff has shown you on the properties all adjacent to this. If you've noticed, they all were B2s at one time, rezoned, removal of commercial property to add higher density developments. All the B2s along Shore Drive are going away. I understand it's mentioned in here about over commercial, don't over commercialize Shore Drive. I don't think they really meant remove all commercial property and make it all residential. Uh, I, I may have missed that in that discussion. Uh, again, per staffs, the comprehensive plan recommends, and you heard it before, future residence uses should strive to achieve the lowest reasonable density to be compatible with existing residential densities. There is no way that this is compatible with the adjacent densities. The largest density right across the street on North Shore Drive, A18. And the last one I found most interesting, the city code states for apartment zoning, that it is not the intention to create additional A24 or A36 districts. This is an A24, actually, what is it, 31 and a half, something like that. But anyways, if you follow your apartment district code, you shouldn't go above A18, which is similar to the zoning across the street. So worst case, knock it down to A18, reduce the densities. Sounds like everybody else would be happy with that. Reduce the size. If you want to see a structure that's going to be very similar to this, Pinewell Station, up on East Ocean View, look at that. That's 145 units. The mass of, this, of that does not com, you know, fit that neighborhood. It won't fit ours. Thank you. Any questions? No. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Wendy Crutchfield, followed by Amanda Logsdon. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Wendy Crutchfield, and I wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to share my observations and, um, raising my, uh, and raise my concerns for this project. I have uh, owned a townhouse adjacent to the property since 1992. It's on, on Ocean Tides Drive. And I wanted to refer to the uh, comprehensive plan in my remarks. Um, it's specified in the plans that the council should, or the city should advance the interests of the larger community rather than simply responding to the needs of individual property owners. Um, and you can see that the neighborhood has been very unified in their objection to the current proposal. Um, being that I've had the house across, the townhouse across the street since 92, I, um, I do know that there is a dog park that's there um, it's been used by the Mariner's Landing neighborhood. It's maintained, as a previous speaker was saying, we are very good about maintaining our properties around here. Um, we take care of it, mow it, trim the trees, um, supply dog waste bags, and take the trash to the street weekly. 
Um, neighbors use it to bring their dogs um, out for a stretch um, when they get home from work. And also neighbors use this, uh, this path as a, um, cross, <coughs> uh, as a crosswalk to or path to the beach. So they actually, you can see where they would go right th through the paper street of ocean tides to Shore Drive and then use the crosswalk. So by eliminating that, you are actually taking a, um, a public use and changing it to a strictly <coughs> private use. Um, the, sh the comprehensive plan says that the city should preserve or further enhance the existing residential areas and amenities, and Marlin Bay Apartments does exactly the opposite. Um, being a witness to uh, several uh, storm events, there is, is actually no flooding or drainage issues there. Um, the developer continued to say that the, that the area is 100% impervious. Um, but that is not true, and I submitted pictures that, that show how much green space is there, and there's never been a flooding problem there. <clears throat> um, also, uh, that the um, development will more than double the density of any parcel in Ocean Park. We've got the expansion of Winsong Apartments, Westminster Canterbury, Overture. Point Overture isn't at full capacity yet, um, so we have all of that to uh, add to the problems with traffic on Shore Drive. So I just wanted to wrap it up by saying it's a, this is a stark contrast with the city of Virginia Beach's comprehensive plan. And the city's goal should be to protect the vitality of this area. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Any Thank questions? You. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda Logsdon followed by Matt Thompson. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Um, as an Ocean Park resident and former real estate developer. Ma'am, can you state your name for the record, please? I will. Okay. Uh, for the record, my name is Amanda Logsdon. As an, Ocean Park, as an Ocean Park resident and a former real estate developer, I think I can offer a unique perspective to the Planning Commission, and I appreciate your time this afternoon. I was born and raised in Virginia Beach and grew up as a devoted resident in service to the community. After graduating from high school and university over 20 years ago, I moved to Northern Virginia to pursue a career in commercial real estate as both a construction and development manager. I have built over 2.5 million square feet of mixed use real estate, studied planning and placemaking with the Urban Land Institute, and most recently developed and operated a luxury apartment and mixed use building in Arlington, Virginia with 591 apartment units that both complements and supports the surrounding neighborhood. Last year, I moved to Virginia Beach and currently work as a general contractor in the federal space, both at Norfolk Naval and at Little Creek. In April of this year, I purchased a single family home at the corner of Powhatan Avenue and West Stratford, thereby both working and living along the Shore Drive corridor. I believe in smart, strategic, sustainable urban growth but as currently designed, I cannot support the Marlin Bay development for the following three reasons. Parking, egress, and storm infrastructure. Parking, the current, currently uh, planned density and parking ratio are not su uh, sufficient to support the future apartment residents and their guests. The three ships development across the street at a much lower density cannot support the current residents and already overflow onto West Stratford and the surrounding streets. Coupled with public visitors and to the Bay and the Brock Center, the neighborhoods on both sides of Shore Drive will not be able to withstand the added cars from Marlin Bay. This will create more pedestrian safety, safety issues within the neighborhoods and across an already dangerous Shore Drive, much like the issues at Marina Shores and Great Neck Road. Egress. The proposed Ocean Tides Drive as egress for the apartments, in addition to the Marlin Bay Drive, um, this intersection is already dangerous, and without a streetlight and crosswalks will add to the congestion and danger at Shore Drive. Um, egress should be limited to entering only at Marlin Bay Drive, or a streetlight should be added. Um, my home for storm for infrastructure is one of the original houses to Ocean Park and sits at the lowest elevation in relation to the new development at West Stratford. I think that stormwater tension vaults at Marlin Bay should be increased to support the community's need. Um, in summary, I think that the proposed density is not commensurate with the real, um, residential area at this portion of Shore Drive. And while I don't oppose multifamily mixed-use development, I would ask that the Planning Commission 
and the stakeholders continue to work with the neighborhoods um, on these concerns to create a successful project. Thank you for your comments. Any questions? Thank you. Matt Thompson. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you for your time. Uh, as for the record, I'm Matt Thompson. I raised my family uh, in Ocean Park with my two daughters. One's a Hokie, one's a Duke now. Uh, I can just tell you since 2014, when I moved to Ocean Park, it doesn't resemble the same neighborhood. Uh, it's disheartening to see the number one, the traffic that re resembles more like Northern Virginia than uh, Virginia Beach. And that's not an inconvenience to me. I can choose where I live, but it's dangerous. And you have seen, as one of my neighbors pointed out very acutely, there's been an uptick in accidents, uh, and it's very become very dangerous. Uh, in addition to that, the development of these massive structures, and I would point to, and I'm not sure the name of it, the one east of the Lesnar Bridge, which uh, after the Lesnar was rebuilt, and put in there is blocked. It takes away from the aesthetic beauty uh, of the area. So it's a situation where we're trying to get our cake and eat it too. Um, and so I also oppose this, not because I oppose this property being developed, but because I oppose it based on the way it is written and being uh, presented. One, it does not meet uh, the definition of rezoning on a conditional permit. Nowhere in this proposal can I see any criteria that meets mixed use. And as my neighbors have pointed out, the density, the density uh, is a massive issue. And so to your question, Ms. Oliver, about the Marlin Bay Drive, when everybody brings their friends over for Flotopia, that's where they're going to park. And that's a problem for our neighborhood. So. With that being said, uh, we are certainly open. We understand that this is valuable property, but we would like it done in a responsible manner. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Are Scott or Gaynell Ayers here or Phil Roos? Please come up, sir. Please. And what was your name? I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Scott Ayers. Scott. Madam Clerk, did you catch got that? Okay. Yeah, I got an okay. email reply. Good afternoon. My name is Scott Ayers, and I've lived in Ocean Park for 35 years. First of all, I'd like to thank you for your service. Having volunteered to serve on the Bayfront Advisory Commission for over 20 years, I understand the commitment you make to promote the city's growth to benefit the residents and our future generations. A number of years ago, with the assistance of the planning department and the city attorney's office, and assisted, we assisted city council in formulating a plan for the future development of Shore Drive, as was one of the key recommendations of the city-funded ULI study. The Shore Drive quarter plan and its design guidelines were approved by the planning commission and city council. The BAC was also assisted with this process by their liaisons from the Planning Commission and City Council. With their assistance, the plan and the guidelines were approved and made part of the City Comprehensive Plan. With the plan, the BAC and the Planning Department now had a mechanism to guide the City's vision for the Shore Drive Corridor, an enforceable code to follow, not one to be bent to fit the applicant's needs. Following the design guidelines meant consistent application of the principles for growth within the most densely populated corridor in the city. It is my opinion that the application you're acting on today is in non-compliance with, with the in-place ordinances that were designed to govern growth within the Shore Drive corridor and specifically Ocean Park. With the exception of plan review by BAC, there has been no attempt by the applicant to sit down with the Ocean Park community and in good faith discuss what kind of project might benefit the community and the applicant. The applicant's answer to density has been, if we don't get this many units to the project, it's not economically feasible. I ask the question, now whose problem is that? Certainly not the residents of Ocean Park. 
Ocean Park is not anti-growth or anti-development. The fact is the community looks forward to the development of the property, but not as presented today by the applicant. Another fact is that directly across the street from the applicant's property sits a mixed-use property. It's the only mixed-use property in Ocean Park built and approved under the current guidelines. At first, it did not have the community's support, but with the input from the community, planning staff, and the developer, the design guidelines were followed, and the community supported the project. The developer followed the shore drive guidelines for mixed use. Why shouldn't today's applicant do the same? In my opinion, today's application under the mixed use guideline is a ruse. Virginia Beach, although a very young sir, city. Thank you for your comments. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair, I believe that's the last of the in person speakers. We have two WebEx speakers okay. remaining. Is there? I registered yesterday. What's your name? Jay Oh, come on up. Yep. Sorry. I'm so, I apologize. It's fine. It's fine. Chair. No problem. We have one more change. Who? Browning. Welcome, ma'am. Good afternoon. My name is Gaynell Ayers. I've lived at 3780 Jefferson Boulevard, as my parents did, as my grandparents did. So we've been there for almost 100 years. Ocean Park in the 50s didn't have running water. We didn't have city water. We did have, get, we had dirt streets, but no public services. Fast forward to 2021, we now have city water but an antiquated sewer and storm sewer system, along with narrow streets that during an emergency, fire trucks, ambulances have a very difficult time getting by. And that's on both sides of Shore Drive, not just on the Bay side. The Bayfront Advisory Committee did a study in 2011 and found that that corridor, Shore Drive corridor, had the highest residential real estate tax assessment per acre in the city. Interestingly, the least public school students per acre. That's a big revenue winner for the city. Ocean Park, platted in 1912, is one of Virginia Beach's historic neighborhoods and one the city should be very proud of. Ocean Park de deserves better than the proposed Marlin Bay. <laughs> On August 3rd, 2021, City Public Works issued an update on phase four of the Shore Drive Improvement Project. The update states that the existing Ocean Park stormwater system is inadequate. You can ask the project manor, manager, Bill Purcell, who says Ocean Park needs major stormwater upgrades. The report states phase four will start and maybe start in 2026 and be completed by 2029. Phase three time schedule, if phase three time schedule is any measure of accuracy, Ocean Park will be lucky to see the completed improvements this decade. Without completion of phase four, Ocean Park could be devastated by a storm like Ida that we just had. I remember being carried out on an army dock during the Ash Wednesday storm when our house fell in the water. <clears throat> I don't wish this on my family or anyone else's. Marlin Bay would nearly double the number of Ocean Park residents on the south side of Shore Drive and put unbearable strain on the existing Ocean Park infrastructure. And that would ex could easily accelerate the failure during a major storm. This is something we all have to address. <clears throat> Consideration of the project at best should be deferred until the project, until phase four is complete, an environmental study is done. Ma'am, thank you for your comments. I appreciate it. Thank any, you. Any questions? No, but I'd thank love you. your glasses. They look adorable. Mm -hmm. Very good. Oh, thank you. For <laughs> <laughs> is Phil Roos here? R O U S? Okay, um, Terry Browning. Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon. My name is Terry Browning. I am uh, the owner of 3829 Shore Drive, uh, along with my two brothers. My parents purchased this property nearly 50 years ago uh, to run our family boat business. Uh, we've been in business since 1955, and 20 years into business, we moved to Virginia Beach. We saw the opportunity for growth. Our customer base was here in Virginia Beach, and we could uh, expand our business. We've been operating in Shore Drive. We bought this property as it was looked like a viable financial move for my family. We were able to afford this property by buying by selling boats and being in the boat business. Um, we've owned this property. We tragically lost my parents in 1999 in a plane crash. Uh, my brothers and I have had to run this business uh, since then, and we found it very difficult now in uh, going forward to support three families out of the boat business. My father and mother bought this property knowing that was going to be our future going forward. And we have lived through all the zoning changes and changes in the city of Virginia Beach. We have owned a beach cottage on Surrey Road since 1951. Our family has spent summers in Ocean Park. And as you can imagine, Ocean Park looks quite a bit different now than it did in 1951. Uh, but as with everything, we know that uh, things change, laws change, and we move forward. Us as property owners try to deal with these changes and conform to what's asked of us to develop our properties. We're at a point in our property now that we need to uh, move forward and go from where we are now and develop this and try to uh, pick out something on this property that we felt was good for our family and our future, our children, our grandchildren, and was good for the Ocean Park community. We have many choices of many things we could do on our property. My property is zoned V2, and I can do quite a few things on that. In soul searching and doing research on this, we felt like this was the best solution we could to go forward to be financially viable for us. I'm just a land leaser in this deal. I'm not the builder, uh, but this is going to take care of my family uh, in future years. and. Uh, I know people are opposed to change, but change happens. And I want to thank you uh, for consideration of this, and I feel like we need to move this project forward. I think this is the best we can do with this property. And with the rules they change now and the infrastructure needed, it does take this to build, to be viable, financially viable. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Thanks. Any questions? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I believe that was our last in-person speaker. We have two WebEx speakers remaining. Kim Mayo, followed by Martin Thomas. Ms. Mayo, if you would please wait two to three seconds and then state your name and begin your comments, please. I'm Kim Mayo and I oppose this. I'm not personally against all development or change. I've lived many places, including our Shore Drive Corridor for over 25 years. But I am against overdevelopment and its unintended consequences. Some on our planning commission, unfortunately, have a reputation for favoring big developer interests over citizens, especially in our neighborhood. Let's let McCleskey build under by right zoning. It would have far fewer negative consequences on our community. Those negative impacts include burdens on police, given the current staffing shortages, increased pollution, noise, infrastructure challenges, more traffic and impacts on our quality of life. From my expertise as a conservationist, often the costs of development outweigh the tax benefits, and I'm talking about actual dollar costs here, not just hidden costs. After West Windsong and Tower of Westminster, people are fed up. Residents having their sunlight blocked and rights infringed upon. My dear friend, a retired local college professor had a multi-story condo built right next to her property. Her charming cottage was literally engulfed by it. After 40 years of living there, live oaks were ripped down, birds she loved so much disappeared. We can hardly turn our car around in her driveway anymore, and I truly believe the stress from this contributed to her stroke. That's what's happening. Her story needs to be heard. Who is protecting the rights of existing property owners? 
Specific to Marlin Bay Apartments, I agree with civic leaders of Ocean Park and many surrounding communities that this is not in keeping with our master plan regarding density for Pleasure House Point or the Shore Drive overlay. Four and a half story buildings and 197 units is not low to medium density, which is 12 to 18 units per acre and in keeping with the surrounding area. The proposed height and giant building size is not complementary or in keeping with residential or commercial uses in the area. The height and size will overwhelm existing residential uses. Expert testimony from one of your own former planning council members, as we heard, shows the property across the street first came in as a four story building. The developer was asked to redesign the project to be consistent with the surrounding area. Staff could not support the proposal. Why then should McCleskey get special treatment? Regarding Pleasure House Point, how would this high density development in a flood zone be complementary? Our tax dollars have made a huge investment in protecting this open space gym. The master plan reads, quote, ensure that any development is complementary with regard to both design and land use to our natural resource and open space amenity, Pleasure House Point. It clearly is not. Based on my expertise on open space, the idea of building high density developments is not in keeping not in keeping with the surrounding area that about conservation land without proper environmental impact studies is not a best practice. Many using Pleasure House Point have dogs and more feces would strain and further pollute our Lynn Haven River. I like seeing stars and not bright lights. Many other cities require the mitigation of light pollution on new development. Our final speaker today is Martin Thomas. Mr. Thomas, if you would wait two to three seconds and then please state your name and begin your comments. Hello, my name is Martin Thomas. Uh, opportunity to be here. And I appreciate all your service. I know what it's like to serve on a public body. I know the challenges, thanklessness. I've been a resident of Ocean Park for 16 years. I live on Roanoke Avenue. Um, I'm not gonna go over uh, I'm an attorney, and luckily everybody else has already said it, most of what I wanted to say, so you don't get bored by another attorney. But I would like to comment on a couple of the aspects. As Mr. Salmon pointed out, you know, the Bayfront area is unique in and of itself, but the ULI study singled out Ocean Park as being a different character than the rest of the Bayfront community. And it recommended that we not engulf it by having multi-use, I mean, multi-family uh, projects th that are incongruent with the duplexes and single-family homes that primarily occupy Ocean Park. One of the members of the commission mentioned that there was a lot of abandoned retail in the area. That doesn't exist on the west side of the Lesnar Bridge, which is Ocean Park. Uh, there are no abandoned retail places along there. Uh, and quite frankly, I'm not opposed to development, and I've wanted that lot developed for a long time. But I like to see real mixed use development. I'm not opposed to apartments either. Uh, but this is not a real mixed use development. This is tacking on a boat existing business to, to tr call it mixed use. It's not adding any uh, retail why not have a mixed use on this lot? Have some retail with some uh, other uh, parcels above it. One of the reasons that it's been difficult to develop retail along Shore Drive is because the, the commercial lots are so shallow. This is a deep lot that would allow for a lot of different uses in the commercial vein, uh, including mixed use. And, and, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk. Um, I, I don't want to go over what everybody else has said, although I agree with most of what they said. Uh, I just urge you to consider the ULI study and consider the impact on this neighborhood, which is a very unique neighborhood. Thank you very much. No more speakers. No more speakers. All right. Mrs. Murphy. Thank you all for your patience. Um, I'll be very brief. I just wanted to address a few issues, um, specifically the B4 SD district, which is the one that we uh, have proposed the conditional rezoning to. 
specifically allows for a density of 36 units per acre. Um, what we've provo proposed is just over 31 units per acre. I know speakers have uh, spoken about the apartment districts and infill in the apartment districts. This B4 SD district is unique to Shore Drive, and it was part of the Shore Drive overlay. And it provides for a mix of uses. I know um, a lot of folks, when they think mix of uses, they think town center, and that's vertical. Um, the Shore Drive mix of uses is really meant to be horizontal. If you look at, again, the Pearl, you've got the surf rider and you've got the apartments. It's not all in the same uh, in the same building. So this is conceptually very different than uh, uh, the town center type area. With regard to parking, there are 390 parking spaces, 358 are multifamily, 32 are for the 12,000 square foot buildings. Um, the applicant could have, because this is mixed use, asked for a shared parking arrangement. Obviously, the commercial use uh, times uh, especially with the boat sales, is going to be different from the residential. Um, so there will more likely been, than not be an excess of residential spaces because the residents are parking when the businesses are not necessarily open. Um, what I've heard a lot about is parking on Marlin Bay Drive. If you look at the city's website, uh, Pleasure House Point is a 118 acres of city open space. It's part of the Parks and Recreation Department and it's public for the whole city. The website says the parking is on Marlin Bay Drive um, because frankly, there is no other way to get into Pleasure House Point. Um, the beaches on Shore Drive, which you know, I live in the city, I frequent them just as much as anybody else, um, they're public beaches. And you know, where you have public beaches, uh, it sounds like you're gonna have parking issues. I'll tell you, my family was in town last weekend. We left for the beach at 1230. I told them that was too late and we couldn't find a parking space, so we went back home and went to the pool. Um, you know, those challenges, it sounds like, are challenges that have to do with the public spaces more so than what we're proposing. Obviously, this is going to be self-parked. Uh, we're going to have more than enough parking on site for the uh, both of the uses. Uh, a lot of it has been made of the character of the neighborhood, the fact that this is, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a residential neighborhood. This specific area, because it's right along Shore Drive, is in what the, what the city staff report calls a mixed zone. And uh, the staff report finds that the density in use is appropriate in the mixed zone as a transition. So where you have a, uh, a highly traveled, you know, major arterial roadway, um, you're going to want some sort of a transition back to the residential, uh, the more single family residential uses. This type of use is a uh, transitional use that would be appropriate. Um, there was a Ocean Tides Drive, and I, I think Rick Lohman came up for this as well. Um, the part that we're closing is is here. It, it's not used by anybody um, for vehicular access other than the, uh, the, the boat facilities. I think she had a concern that this somehow this was being closed. This is, this is not being closed at all. Um, it's just within the parcel itself. And as the viewers uh, who are required to go out and look at the request for a street closure have indicated, there are other ways to get across, more specifically, the signalized intersection where folks can walk across. So nobody can actually use a car now um, other than the folks entering the Browning and Lynn Haven Marine facilities. Uh, what they were looking at, I think, uh, was the people who might be walking to get across Shore Drive, but again, uh, they found there wouldn't be a public inconvenience because you've got a signalized intersection to get folks across. Um, the purpose of the landscaping, which is a cat category four landscape buffer, it, it will be 15 feet wide. The trees will grow up to 30 feet. You've got bushes that'll grow up to, to five feet. The intention of that is to provide that buffer. Um, and really, they'll just because of the, the view shed and the, the line of sight, they'll screen uh, a lot of the uh, duplexes that back up there. Um, there was a comments made about um, height, the, um, and I'm not sure where they came from. The staff report indicates that the section facing the intersection is three stories, uh, which was a, a major reduction in height and in density from what was originally proposed. Uh, but the four and a half stories, where that comes from is the parking garage. So stories in a parking garage don't have the same height as stories in a residential building. So the, um, the four stories in that 
those wings of the, the building will actually shield the parking garage. So we're talking four and a half stories. That's, that's really kind of a misnomer. Uh, as far as maintenance, as was mentioned, the Terry Peterson companies and the McCleskey and, and Browning families are long-term owners. They're not going to be selling this project. They will maintain it the way they've maintained all of their uh, projects and properties in the city. And in some cases, as was mentioned, they don't have a, a mandatory civic league um, or a, a property owners association. The maintenance of this facility will be top notch. I mean, you can't say that for every area of the city where you don't have uh, a commercial entity doing the maintenance. Proffer number four, there was a mention of lighting. Proffer number four details that lighting on the property will be limited to that which is necessary for security and safety purposes, and it'll comply with applicable laws, so it'll be shielded uh, to prevent glare and spillover onto other properties. Uh, this really is, as, as we've heard and as the staff report indicates, the highest and best use for this property. Uh, it will be a tremendous upgrade and really provide a gateway feature uh, into Shore Drive and into the, the, uh, the city itself. I'm happy to answer any questions. I think Rick Lohman can address um, traffic, but I think the, the traffic study and the professional review of that have indicated that there will not be a negative impact uh, on traffic in the corridor and at the intersections. Any, any questions? I, Mrs. I got, Murphy. I got, yeah. I got one, Mrs. Murphy. I just want to <clears throat> clarify because um, you touched, you touched queer, I, when sure I caught it. Okay. <laughs> when you first started. On um, Marlin Bay, there's a, a new median break for the entrance to the parking garage. Further down on um, Ocean Tide, there is a median break. You're not closing that. No, we're not doing anything with that okay. section of Ocean Tides at all. I just wanted to be very clear on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Jack? Mm -hmm. So where are the dumpsters going to be located? Um, the dumpsters will actually be at the uh, rear. Don, do you want to address? They're proposed in this area. Okay. Okay, yeah, simple enough. That? I mean, that's my to follow up. I mean, I just, you can hear dumpsters when they, when they slam those things down. It's. You can hear him half a mile away. No. Just. Okay. While you're up here, real quick, um, we, nobody's really touched base on what's going on in Shore Drive um, part of the, I mean, the um, from the apartments to Shore Drive, the sidewalk and everything. What's what's happening up there? Are you asking me? Yes, yes, okay. sir. Um, yes, sir. Sorry. <clears throat> the first of all, as you know, that area is drained by ditches, and so we're gonna we would be proposing to um, do curb and gutter. Mm. And then there would be a verge from that curb to the um, proposed 10 foot wide multi-use path, which is again called for all the way, the whole length of Shore Drive. And then there would be an additional setback to what would be the um, entrances out of the first floor apartments. So a bit of a unique feature to try to create a more residential feel along the street or there would be stoops that would actually uh, exit out of the apartments down onto that multi-use path. Okay. And then there's a, an additional main entrance right, right where the pointer is, which is kind of another um, entrance into the entire building. Okay. Um, and then, of course, landscaping and, and trees and everything that, that don't exist today. Right. Okay. Just want to find that. Yes, sir. And where are the other entrances to the building besides the one you just pointed to off the shore drive? <clears throat> This is the main entrance right here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you come in here and there'll be a leasing office and that's a you know, direct line through to the uh, community center or um, recreation center. You also have, you have garage entrances here and here. So access to the interior of the building will be secured. And about, uh, on the buffer that's between uh, the lower wing of the building and the houses that uh, back up to that. Uh, could you describe what that buffering is going to consist of, the trees? Uh, I, as, I, as I mentioned before, I don't have specific species. Our goal is, of course, to, to have them be as tall as they can be um, for screening purposes. The, just to clarify, the 15 feet is the width 
of that easement. I mean, I'm sorry, of the, um, the setback. Yeah. And so it's a 15 foot width, and then we would um, plant as tall trees as was practical in that 15 foot width. Yeah, the proffer uh, looks like it's, um, or the condition we have in here, trees will be per permitted to grow to maintain the minimum height of 20 feet and the shrubs um, height of five feet. <laughs> About and to tag onto that, the the impacts to the residents' um, sunlight. Can you can you do anything? So this is south, and so the sun essentially goes like this, and these shadows are a bit of a um, in, uh, improperly placed. This would be. Uh, I'm not even sure when this would actually. The shadows would actually go this way. So it wouldn't, so the sun's not going to, it wouldn't impact any kind of height of trees or anything, it wouldn't impact the backyards of the, <coughs> in terms of sunlight hitting there. Wait. If somebody wants to grow something back there, their tomato, you know, something, this, would you say that this is not impactful to anything that they currently have in but, terms of sunlight hitting right, the back? The intent, the intent is that the, you know, again, shadows go this way we haven't we haven't studied every possible sun angle but the general idea is that the sun is in the south and shines right any impact would probably be in the after late afternoon if there is an impact yes okay, okay. yes um so so you're building up the site seven seven to nine feet uh up to elevation seven or nine you're just the site in general or at least um but the storm, so you have to put the stormwater management under. Where's the stormwater draining? What's the general direction of where it's going to go once it leaves the site? The outfall is this direction. It's an existing outfall that goes into the. Um, there's actually a BMP inside of Pleasure House Point, <clears throat> and then it discharges into the into the creek from there. So where would the stormwater management facilities? I mean, I know they're underground, but I mean, where are they going to be? Placed. They're all throughout all the areas that you see. So under the green space, under the under parking lot, in this area. Yeah. So they're going to be down and down there. So, so to, to install those, the sites may even have to be elevated even more. So to get, I don't know how tall they're going to one foot, two foot, three foot. And then you have cover over those. Um, they're in the ground, uh, the sandy soil. So some of that may infiltrate. Um, where I'm getting at is the finished floor elevation. You know, maybe higher than what seven to nine is that? Do you know the finished floor elevation at this time, or is I don't have a specific finished floor elevation, but I don't think it's. I mean, we're, we're certainly not going to build it up any higher than we have to. I mean, it's going to be um, what's required in order to meet the meet the code. Right to uh, to drain the site, which um, and then may bring it up a little bit just to you know, for architectural look of the site. Okay. The, okay. The volume will be brought, be brought underground. I mean, currently the uh, water is going uh, north to, to Shore Drive where there's a drainage and to Marlin Bay Drive to the south, and there's no stormwater management at all on the property. Right. And it was mentioned, I think somebody said it, it was, you know, the whole site's impervious, but not, not really. I think what's already PDH1, I think that's not impervious. So what currently is... The Browning the, property, of course, is. The, um, but by the definition of the this, of the city stormwater uh, regulations, it is impervious. Gravel is impervious mm -hmm. for water quality. Okay. Any other questions? Any questions? All right. Thank you very much. We will um, close this out and look at Mr. Redmond. Mr. Weiner. This is your neck of the woods. Um, it is my neck of the woods. I rode my bike up Mr. Shore Redmond, Drive when you, I was. Would oh, you like to oh, thank you. To oh, yes, I have to. to thank you for the reminder. I have a, um, I have a disclosure to make. There is a broker in my office. I work in the real estate broker, as a real estate broker. There is a broker in my office who does some work for uh, McCleskey and Associates. Um, has a listing that sells some land for them. I do not. I don't participate in any way in that. 
haven't received any remuneration ever from McCleskey or from Terry Peterson or from Mr. Browning or anybody else. Don't now. Um, so it doesn't affect me in any way. Um, and the conflict of interest laws, of course, define me as just as you all would or any other you know, broker in the real estate business. So, um, but I wanted to be sure to disclose, disclose that. Um, and, uh, and I will be voting and commenting on the application. Thank you, Tori. Um, I, have a, I have a disclosure to make also. Um, uh, as an attorney, I have represented uh, before another project, uh, Terry Peterson. Um, I don't, I'm not representing him uh, currently, and we will. Um, we, I, we don't, I don't have any financial interest in the project, in this project, or any other project they've done, so I feel free to vote. Okay. Thank you. I was riding my bike up Shore Drive when I was about 14 years old. Wasn't old enough to drive. Um, that would have been 79, um, 1979. Um, so I'm well familiar with this corridor, and I want to be clear that we're, we're talking about the entire Shore Drive corridor and the Shore Drive plan and the Shore Drive overlay and the Shore Drive, all of these things that, that, that I think we have to view in the broader Shore Drive context and not merely in terms of Ocean Park. For the life of me, I don't understand how this is going to negatively impact Ocean Park, but I still think we have to recognize that there's, that there's more than just this. Quiet, please you know, than, than just this one little pocket at the corner of Marlin Bray and Shore Drive. There are a number of things about this application that I think are, are very attractive. You can stare at that slide and see there's a heck of a lot more green on it than exists today. There's more turf, there's more shrubs, there's more trees, there's stormwater that's going to be installed that doesn't exist today. At the same time, it reduces the impervious cover on site. So it certainly is a much greener application. The infrastructure is clearly an improvement. We don't have any infrastructure in terms of stormwater there today. Um, the architecture, I think, is, is extremely attractive. I have driven this site in the context of this application five times, specifically including, again, yesterday afternoon and got, you know, tried to make myself get lost. It's very hard because I'm very familiar with this place, but just sort of noodled around back in the neighborhoods and then turned around, went all the way up to Great Neck Road and came back and just looked at the entire corridor. From this site, I can throw a rock and hit Bay Vista, Chesapeake House, 3556 on the bay. If I go west, I'm going to run into the, to the shopping center that has the Kroger in it and the four-story Victoria Place and then another uh, shop, small shopping center. On either side of this site, are multi-story buildings. All throughout the Shore Drive corridor are multi-story buildings. Within Ocean Park itself, single family and duplex residences that are three stories themselves. Um, and what's proposed for that corner is three stories. Um, uh, I don't understand, you know, it reminds me of an old joke. Here, I'll give you a joke. How many Virginians does it take to change a light bulb? Anybody know? Three. Takes three. Takes one to change the bulb and two to admire the old one. <laughs> and I just don't know what it is we're admiring about this site that would cause us to see that as a negative impact over the broken down storage yard, the building that's got the water stains on it, you know, it's got some of the material peeling off it that I saw yesterday. The streets that are to be closed aren't streets, they're two dead ends. Somebody said they use it as a dog park. All right, well, they're not streets. There's no reason to keep open streets that see, serve no useful public purpose for which we should maintain. And in fact, any redevelopment of that site, those, those two dead ends are going to be closed. You put a warehouse there, and they're going to need to close those streets. So in any event, you know, if I thought this would in some way damage the Shore Drive corridor, I would be the first guy saying, forget it. And in fact, that's the first thing I said um, to the applicant when I fir first met with them, it seems like a million years ago, um, that we've been talking about this, is, you know, this has to be very high end. And from what I see from the, from the, from the, um, from the elevations, from the landscape plan, from the infrastructure that's added, and frankly, the appropriateness of the building height in the context of this broader character, that's what I'm talking about, um, 
I just don't see how this is anything but a positive addition to the shore drive corridor and something I think in the end we'll be proud of. So um, I'm certainly going to support the application. I'll be happy to make a motion at the time and then I'll just sit back and let you all do your thing too. Thank you everyone who came here today. Um, I had a lot of conversations with an awful lot of folks uh, for many, many, many months and as I said, I've, I've been over there a million times now, and, uh, but I've known it very frankly since I was a boy. Um, so I didn't need to learn a whole lot more. Thank you, Mr. Wiener. Thank you, sir. Oh, then I have to move. Yes, Mrs. Klein. So I took everything into account and wrote my thoughts down. Um, so I want to start by saying every developer I've seen from this seat has said that their parking plans exceed the requirements and they've never had a problem with parking. I challenge them to talk directly to their residents. There is never enough parking. Um, I'm very familiar with the housing shortage in my role. Density changes are inevitable and cities across the country are revis revising their zoning guidelines to accommodate this need. In this particular case, however, I take issue most with the type of apartments proposed. If I had known at 18 that how the salary of a social worker translates into the real world, I may have reconsidered. The average hourly wage to afford a two bedroom rental in Virginia is slightly, um, under $25 an hour, and it took me more than a few years to reach that number after graduation. I'm a master's educated professional, and I make well below the median household income in Virginia Beach, which is 98,000 as of 2019. The home I purchased in 2018 cost less than half of the median home price of $324,000. My son and I live with our two dogs in a 1,000 square foot home with two bedrooms, one and a half bathrooms, and a mortgage of about $800 per month. Owning a home is exhausting and I miss apartment life, but a comparably sized dog-friendly apartment in the city starts at $1,300, an increase of over 60%. If I'm willing to forego air conditioning, that number drops to $1,200. Renting in Virginia Beach without significant lifestyle changes is fiscally impossible for me, and we are pricing out the younger workforce we are trying to attract. So for that reason, I will be voting no. Thank you. Mr. Graham. Um, I uh, yeah, I appreciate everybody that came in opposition. I've talked to a number of you, and um, you know, I, I live in, I've said it before, and I'm sure you guys are tired of hearing it, but I live in the Great Neck Shore Drive area. I drive by this property, you know, probably five times a week. Um, I grew up in Virginia Beach, <laughs> probably driven by this property, you know, you know, thousands of times. Um, I, I, I agree with Mr. Redman. Um, you know, and, and, and I mean, sometimes you kind of look at how, to, how, you know, does it check all the boxes, and you look at traffic. Um, and to kind of go over this, it, this is a reduction in the traffic that could be created by the by the current zoning. If 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 you were to you if you were to build what the current zoning allows, you would create more traffic than what this project uh, would create. Um, the uh, the project's not going to promote neighborhood traffic. I mean, it's right at a corner. People are going to drive in. They're going to go into their parking garage. I don't see them parking um, in the neighborhood or dr really driving through the neighborhood. Um, you, know, we, you know, Mr. Redman talked about the height. I'm not going to go into that. Um, you know, the, the uh, some people have, have mentioned other uses for the property, uh, retail and commercial, restaurant. Um, and have said that there's not any vacant buildings on the side of the Lesnar Bridge. Well, there may not be right now, but there have been in the past, and we all know that. Um, at one point, there was a there was a Harris Teeter that was going to go on the other corner of Marlin Bay. Um, I know because I was the developer and I was working with Harris Teeter, and Harris Teeter turned the site down because when you in in the world of commercial real estate. You look at demographic rings, and when you do the demographic rings here, you pick up water, you pick up marsh. You don't pick up that many people. I know it seems like a lot of people, but in the world of commercial real estate, there's not enough demand to say we're gonna do all commercial on this site. Matter of fact, uh, one of the other planning commissioners brought up 
the dumpster. If you put restaurants there, you are going to hear dumpsters, a lot more dumpsters than you're going to hear from an apartment complex. I do think that that other building that's left, I think that it has probably a better chance of getting developed or redeveloped or, or modified for an, a retail use if we have this captured audience of apartments right there. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I think that I view this site as, as almost a gateway into the Shore Drive Great Neck area. It is um, a very, I mean, you look at these, at these renderings, this is a very attractive project. Um, it, like I said, checks all the boxes. Um, I don't think stormwater is going to be an issue. It's actually, they're, they're improving the stormwater. Um, yeah, I know that change is, is sometimes uncomfortable. And, but I do think that Shore Drive, this area, it needs to evolve. This is, this is a great use. It's the highest and best use for the site. And I have, I have talked to a lot of people in your neighborhood that are for it and against it. And yeah, there's a lot of people in, in Ocean Park against it. I, uh, I have tried to find a reason to, to not want to see this project approved. I've really tried, and you may not believe that, but I, I have tried. I, I'm going to support this project. I think it's great for the Shore Drive corridor. I think it checks all the boxes. I think it's going to be an improvement. Um, and uh, so anyway, that's, I'm going to be supporting this project. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Who's next? Okay, I've got a couple of things. Is, is Rick still here? Is Rick? Rick Lohman, are you still here? Is he hiding? There he is. Come on up here, Rick. I hate for you to sit here all day and not, you know, get a chance. I have something to say. <laughs> Has some somebody ask you a question? <coughs> right up here. I know. Rick, um, Rick, just tell me about you. you are. Uh, Rick Lohman, city traffic engineer. Thank you. Uh, licensed professional engineer. Thank you. So, Rick, just for just for clarification. On Shore Drive, because yes. there's a lot of conversation about traffic and not traffic. And this morning, in informal, we talked about if by right we use that piece of property for drive-through restaurant. Sure. And how much traffic that would generate, and how much traffic the the apartment complex would generate. Basically, the trips in and out for people going to work and things like that, just for clarity and how, what this road does. Because I thought what you did this morning was a great presentation. Actually, I thought I knew a lot about Shore Drive until you, until you, until you did that. And I think it, think it would be um, just good to just sort of put it on the record a little bit. Sure. Um, so the, the first part of that was the buy right, um, the buy right land use. And looking at the size of the site, um, <coughs> you know they could put a fast food restaurant on the site by right um, with that it would generate um, I think I don't remember the exact numbers but when you add that together with what they could put on the the uh, the other part of the site that's zoned the the other part that's um, not zone B2 um, you could generate about 2,000 trips a day um, most of that being the fast food with the drive-through um, with the apartments they could generate about 1,448 trips per day. So that would mean that there would be a net um, decrease in trips if this lot was developed with apartment versus a fast food restaurant. So, I mean, that's just a fact. Um, as uh, David Bradley mentioned, you know, the trips are going to be different because the apartments will generate um, more traffic in the afternoon um, when people come home and it'll generate some traffic in the morning when people leave for work. Apartments are much different than single-family homes, though. So apartments generate much less traffic than single-family homes. So um, all these uses are different, but in the end, the traffic study considered all that, and the traffic study showed that you know it, it, this development is going to generate 30% less traffic per day than the buy right uses. And I, and I agree with, the, with that. Um, and and then maybe expand a little bit about the type of road that Shore Drive is. Sure. Um, Shore but Drive is, is considered a major arterial, urban arterial in the city of Virginia Beach. I mean, it's one of the, it, it's, it's really the only, um, you know, east-west streets, you know, north of uh, Virginia Beach Boulevard. Um, and as, 
as such, it carries a lot of traffic. The one difference between Shore Drive and Independence Boulevard is that Shore Drive doesn't have any major intersecting uh, intersections, so it can carry a lot more traffic. Your delays on roadways, um, your major roadways, are going to be at your signalized intersections. Um, Independence Boulevard has many signalized intersections that carry a lot of traffic, like Rosemont, uh, Independence Boulevard, um, Lynn Haven. Shore Drive doesn't have it, many of those big intersections. The only ones it really has is Great Neck, um, Pleasure House. Um, as we discussed, First Court's not that big, but it, it's one of the it's one of the bigger ones on Shore Drive in that stretch. So Shore Drive has the capability of carrying a lot more traffic because it because the city can give much more green time to Shore Drive. It doesn't have to give traffic, you know, it doesn't have to give green time to the side streets because the side streets are very, very light. And Marlin Bay is one of those, you know, light side streets. Marlin Bay slash Shady Oaks. So in, in that way, you know, Shore Drive can carry a lot more traffic than another, you know, four lane divided urban major arterial roadway because it just doesn't have that many major intersections. Right. And Thank you, because I think that that's um, extremely important for people to understand that particular artery in our city and how it's used. Um, one thing I would do want to, one of the other things I'd like to ask you about is that, and I don't live on Shore Drive, so I don't know, um, was that there was a reference to this intersection about accidents. Okay, well, um, I took some notes. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did. So I don't I don't know of the of the the crashes that they were speaking about, but I can tell you that we we do we do crash analyses and we we take the last three years of police reports that we have um, for all the signalized intersections in the city and all the roadway segments in the city. So these are the numbers that came directly out of our annual report. The latest report being 2017 to 2019. Um, so there's of the 378 signalized intersections that were studied, um, this intersection ranked. 194th out of 378. So in the bottom half, or right, right about average for crashes, there were 11 crashes in the intersection. And the rank doesn't just count the number of crashes in the intersection. Um, what it does, it takes into account all the, vol the volume of traffic. So it's kind of a weighted average. And it also takes into account the severity of the crashes. So um, this puts this intersection you know, right in the middle of all signalized intersections. Um, it hasn't risen. Um, you know, in the you know from say 2015 to 2017 to this period, um, it, you know it's pretty average about 3.2, 3.3 crashes a year at the intersection, um, and nothing really jumps jumps out at us from that. Yeah. I did check there there haven't been any crashes at the intersection this year, um, which is good news. Uh, the, there have been two crashes around the intersection. One was a rear end crash um, on eastbound Shore Drive past the intersection, just east of the intersection. And the other one was a, a really strange crash um, on Marlin Bay Drive where a woman drove down the wrong side. Uh, and I apologize, it, it may have been a woman or a man. I just saw a woman's name as, as part of the crash. Right. Um, but someone, someone drove the wrong way on Marlin Bay. Um, and they were cited for a DUI. And it was in the middle of the day. It was weird. Right. So good. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other Please. questions for Rick? Yes. Oh, thanks, Rick. Oh, I've well, got one. Okay. And it's not necessarily traffic, but the parking. Thank you. you know, people mentioned parking on Marlin Bay a couple times. Yes. And that's not necessarily traffic, but it's there's no no not parking or what's the restrictions? Because the the parking on the on the uh, I guess the west side of Marlin Bay Drive, it's restricted, and I, I believe it's 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. Don't quote me on those, um, but I know it. <laughs> It's to it's to restrict people from parking there overnight, um, and using the park. So that parking was generally for the you know for Pleasure House Point, um, but the northbound. Uh, I know for at least the first block, there's no parking allowed. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly. We have a lot of roads <laughs> in the city. Um, okay. I could do some <laughs> I could do some research, um, yeah. but but I know that southbound. Right, we but do have this for sure. It's southbound, right? But if it's northbound, and there's no parking, I mean, they can park there. It's if it's allowed, they can park there. It's public parking. Park, I mean. public right away. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. All right. Thanks, Mr. Edmund. All right. It for Thank Rick. You. Anything for Rick? No, nothing. Okay. For oh, we're good with, we're good Thank with you. you. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Rick. You're off, Rick. From for a minute. 
<laughs> yeah, right. Maybe not for long. I go yeah, yes, sir. Okay. Let me go ahead. I just want to start by saying that uh, we are, as uh, Mr. Graham mentioned, we are looking here to see if this is the highest and best use of the property. Uh, and it, we need to have this in, the, in, that, in that context. Also the context of its, its zone B, half of its B2, the other part is, is residential. Um, and there are lots of possibilities with B2 and we've just heard some recent discussion about that. Um, so what do you do with this property and, and, and why is it still sitting there after all this time? It's B2 is a very liberal commercial zoning category. Lots of things can be done in B2, including what we just talked about uh, in the traffic study, the, the restaurant site possibility. So what, what do we do with this property? Then I heard a lot of uh, even the opposition speakers say that they didn't have a problem with apartments. They just have a problem with these apartments and the way it's designed. Uh, well, actually, the Bayfront Advisory uh, commission when in that report they said that um, they were they were great with the architecture and and in fact there was a response to their concerns about architecture that were met by the applicant in terms of reducing the height of that western portion of the structure um, but they also wanted the southern portion of the structure reduced and because they the applicant said that we, we can't do it without 197. That's that's the best we can do to reduce it from 227 to 197. They disapproved the project, uh, although they liked the architecture, as it turned out in, in, in the end, as I read the report. So apartments aren't bad there, according to the sort of a consensus. And so then the, the developer has to figure out, well, okay, uh, they want more aesthetics to the approach to, from the west. So we set it back and we reduce the height. And we enclosed parking, which is part of the guidelines that everybody's supposed to be following now in apartment developments, not to have parking outside the buildings. Right. That's accomplished, that's not cheap to do. But it also sort of forced the building toward the east. And that, unfortunately, is having some impact, obviously, on some homeowners who have spoken to us today, and I, I respect that. Um, they're doing their best to offset that by the planting strip and the height of trees um, that um, will be adjacent on that strip to minimize that impact. Were it not developed as an apartment project, it would most likely be developed with a denser uh, housing and um, on that southern part of the property, which is zoned for, uh, for housing now. Um, so it's, it's uh, and we know that we also have had people comment about how retail is a problem. I mean, get, I mean getting, that's probably what, a good reason why it hasn't been developed in B2 because everybody's afraid to make the investment in B2. Um, and uh, I think that the traffic that's generated on Shore Drive, yeah, sure, it's, it's, it's there are times it's really bad. And, and I, I've lived here 40 some years. I've <clears throat> I used to live up in the Great Neck area. I've driven Shore Drive a million times. I've, I've been in the traffic. Um, and it, but it's, the 197 units in here are not gonna be a significant, according, that's not my opinion. This is the opinion of experts who have analyzed the data and have in, analyzed the sources and the time of day and all that business. And, and uh, I, I don't think that the feeling or the impression that traffic is going to be severely impacted or worsened by this project is real. I, I don't think it's real. Um, so that's that's my thoughts on it. Thank you, sir. Mr. Wall. Um, I think the um, I think the architecture is very good. Um, I think the Peterson Company is a great company. 
Um, I think that, uh, you know, they've worked with the Bayfront Advisory um, Commission to a certain extent. You know, they didn't get quite the approval they were looking for. Um, but they did reduce the number of units. Um, I think it did impact the uh, the landscaping up front on Shore Drive. Um, I think it proved, not proved, but I think it's been shown that the uh, traffic, you know, won't negatively be, shouldn't be negatively impacted or should should be negatively shouldn't be impacted one way or the other. Um, the economics are good, um, provides a fiscal impact positively for the city. Uh, I think they've shown parking you know, shouldn't be negatively, shouldn't be impacted, um, negatively impacted. Um, I think they've dodged, you know, a large bullet with, when the Pleasure House Point Park was already zoned PDH1, so that, that whole area could have been developed. Um, it's a huge, huge track of land. Um, uh, and I'm not sure that anything really is going to satisfy the homeowners within Ocean Park, um, you know, whatever, whatever goes there. However, um, you know, the comprehensive plan, you know, this is suburban focus area one, um, and it's uh, stating there preserve and protect the character of established neighborhoods. Um, I, I think the residents see this, that it will impact them negatively. Uh, the Bayfront Advisory Commission, the way that this is laid out, has pointed that it will impact the, the neighborhood. Um, I'm not sure if it is best and highest use for the property. So I, I, I plan to not support it. And um, uh, I, I will probably support the road collisions, but uh, not the project itself. Okay. Mr. Bradley? I'm uh, hoping to have training wheels for another meeting, but I guess I need to <laughs> take the training wheels off. Um, I'm not too far from uh, what was just discussed. There, there's a lot of positives with the project. I think it's a it's a good looking apartment complex. It it um, and we need we need apartments in the city. I like the multi use walkway that's going to be integrated into it. Uh, it's got nice landscape, and so I think the project itself would look good. Uh, the fiscal impact, you know, as the former budget director in the city, I guess can't ever get that hat off, I guess. But, you know, the fiscal impact is slight in the scheme of things, and I'm not minimizing that. Residential development generally doesn't pay for itself because it's not just the roadways and schools. It's the calls to service for EMS and fire and, and police and more human services workers. So it's slight, and apartments generally are slightly fiscally positive um, because of um, the low school multipliers. But at the end of the day, you know, the stakeholders that live in this community thought that the zoning, you know, had, had a zoning expectation. And this is much denser than what they were expecting. And, you know, one of the things that stood out to me in the informal discussion, and I think the uh, Civic League president vote, brought it up today, was this, uh, I think it's the second page where he talks about the density. And to me, it is a, a dramatic change from what the people that moved in that area, that have invested in that area, um, you know, were expecting. Throw in the fact that the Bayfront Advisory Committee, which is a council appointed committee that looks at those issues in that area, also do not support it. Uh, I'm going to be voting against the application. Okay. Anybody else? No, not this year, but this year. Anybody else? Um, so this is this has been this is obviously this application, and I'll try not to repeat what everybody's said here. Um, has been on um, in the spotlight for quite some time, and interestingly enough, as we all know, we don't have a whole lot of land here left <clears throat> to develop, and um, especially north of the Green Line. And I've been down in Florida a lot lately, just took my daughter down there to school. My parents lived down there. My father was an executive down there for many, many years. And, and Florida's a great state as far as how they seem to do this beautiful dance of 
single family homes and townhouses and three story and four story apartments and high rises all all within the same area of each other and they do it well and everything's landscaped and there's big beautiful sidewalks and there's berms and you transition from one area to another and it's something that I always thought Virginia Beach should aspire or attempt or at least try to hit that target on some lines I think we have not done it more often than we have done it um, but my daughter lives in a I think it's a three-story an apartment and right down literally across the street from her is a development called Baldwin Park absolutely stunning and right next to that is a high-rise and right next to that is the prettiest street with restaurants and apartments on top of that and a large park and I just thought Virginia Beach should try its very best to do something along the lines of that and I think that as much as we look at this it is you know we've got an a garage which is centered in the building so for once we don't have to see it a garage um, parking garage which we see a lot of those down at the resort and so that's concealed and we've got three stories four stories that's not that big a three-story house is not that tall and a four-story building is not that tall we've got it's set back we've got this beautiful segue of this wonderful walk front doors that actually face shore drive and it's developed enough so that we can actually, as Mr. Trower had said earlier, um, granted, unfortunately, the, the, the rents are what they are today. Um, I wish we could get around it. Lord knows the one I'm paying for my daughter down in Florida is a lot higher. But um, that's an economy thing, and that's all over. But when you look at this, and as the landscaping matures, and to be able to walk from here across Marlin Bay, use the Brock Center, do all of that, I, I just think that they've, they've done a, a good job as far as trying to incorporate something that's a, a little bit higher scale design than what we typically see. So I'm, you really? I, I like the project and, um, and I hope, um, it, I'd like to see it go forward. Mr. Horsley. Well, I, I look at I look at these renderings here, and I look at the pictures of the site now, and I say, "Wow, what a difference!" And um, you know, I understand I understand kind of what the neighborhoods what the neighborhoods are talking about about density, but um, they they're willing to drop down on some on the density, and you know, it just uh, I go like the most inman like the highest and best use, and to me right now, this looks like the highest and best use for this piece of property. And, it, and I think it's more than just the highest and best use. It's an amenity for the city. Uh, go along with what Dee just said, you know. I think it's something that, you know, people coming down on Shore Drive and see this, uh, if it's in, these, uh, these renderings here, they, I, th I think it's pretty astonishing to, to, to have a long Shore Drive. So. Um, I don't live over there. I don't think I could stand to live over there in a place that's, that's that tight and whatever, but a lot of people love it, and a lot of people don't like where I live, so that's, that makes a, a good mix of everybody. But this is, uh, if, I, if I was a young person, young professional person looking for, for a start and I could come to Virginia Beach and, and try to find me a, a job, I think it's, this is somewhere I would probably like to, like to pursue and, you know, have that close amenity to get to the the beach and whatever, and I, I just think it's a, a good thing, and I'm, I plan on supporting it. Thank you, sir. Mr. Carson? Uh Yes, sir. Uh, I kind of want to go along with Robin here, uh, I, but, but the money is what the money is, and I don't know how some people afford to start out and live in places like this nowadays, uh, but it's, and my wife agrees with, with the community, of course, uh, but uh, I've had the probably Mr. Mr. Peterson's displeasure of having inspected a 
a few of his properties over the years, and uh, he does a lot better job than a lot of other people in the profession. Uh, I, I mean, I, I've seen places where I've written three and four pages and wait three or four months to get things corrected when here is the exact opposite. Uh, not that he gets a rubber stamp, but uh, uh, he's proven thus far uh, to be good at what he does, and I'll be supporting it. Okay. My turn. Okay. Go. <laughs> Real quick, um, <clears throat> and I'm not going to get back to what everybody else has said, um, but I'm, I'm going to go a different direction. I like doing that. Um, I'm going to bring up something my colleagues are probably tired of me hearing of, but it, I have to because it, it falls in line with what this is. So about 10 years ago, I was out there. I was out there where you are. I was sitting out there with you, and there's a lot more people here. And it was an apartment complex called 525 Apartments at Kempsville, Witch Duck, yeah. and Prince Anne Road. And um, everybody out there was not in favor of Mr. Horsley was up here, and he says he remembers me, but I don't think he does. And I was out there speaking, and... Um, um, and that, that apartment complex is in my backyard in Kempsville, and and nobody liked it, nobody wanted it. But I thought this, you know, this is going to revitalize our our area. And right now, there's 185 apartments in there. And if you ask everybody in the neighborhood today, they'll tell you, "Wow, we can't. We don't even know anybody lives there. We can't tell cars are coming in and out. Um, it's clean. It has. We're bringing development to our area." It's revitalized the neighborhood. It has not lost one penny. Everybody out there said we're going to lose value on our homes. It has not lost one value in the area. If anything, it, it's helped our area out in Kempsville. Um, <clears throat> I'm also a member of another of, um, committee, Envision 2040, which Mr. Horsley there started that committee back in 2012. And back in 2012, we had 440,000 people in this city. Right now, we're at about 460,000. And our goal, not our goal, but it's the, we're, we're progressing by 2040, maybe to have close to a half a million people in this city. And where are we gonna live? We can't find places to live now. And as Ms. Oliver said, there's, we're running out of room to build. I think we really need to take a step back and decide how we're gonna do this. And we have to find places for people to live. Oceana, if I'm not mistaken, Oceana, if working on it now or, or is working on bringing another squadron here, that's close to 3,000 people. We just approved a 400,000 square foot facility in the city of Virginia Beach last month. It's going to bring four to 600 more jobs here to the city. People are coming here to live. People want to live in this corridor. Mr. Redmond said it best um, back in um, Marina Shores when they, they wanted to put the apartment on top of the tennis court. People want to live in your area. I, I know you don't like it. It's changed. People, it's changed. It's called change, but people want to come live in the Shore Drive corridor area. It's a beautiful place to live. They love it. We just have to find places for them to live there. So um, I'm going to be supporting it. Mr. Redmond. Ms. Eisenberg, do I understand correctly we need to vote on these Separately. six and seven as one item? Yes. Eight and nine as another? Mm -hmm. OK. Therefore, I move approval of agenda items number six and seven. I, it's, this is I'll second. It's, it's a street closure. The street closure. Yes. Uh, we, have a, we have a motion by Mr. Redmond. I'll second the motion. Second by uh, Mr. Graham. Vote is open. By recorded vote of nine in favor, one against, agenda items six and seven have been recommended for approval. Mr. Redmond. Mr. Chairman, I move approval of agenda items number eight and nine. I, I second the motion. Motion by Mr. Redmond, second by Mr. Graham. Vote is open. By recorded vote of seven in favor, three against, agenda items eight and nine have been recommended for approval. Great. All right. Um, that is all we have. Any new business? Old business? Good. 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 We're adjourned. Yep.